Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this conference by the European Court of Auditors on the sound financial management in the EU agencies. There are over 40 agencies in the EU, and today we will look at what their role is, how they help the EU to function better, how do they contribute to the daily lives of the citizens. We will also look at how they perform. The Court of Auditors has for this published today its annual report uh, on the financial on the performance of uh, agencies for the financial year 2021. You can find and read all about it on our website um, at, of the ECA. Uh, we will later on look at two main uh, specific discussions and topics that are recurrent for agencies, one being the revolving doors and one being uh, the public procurement. But without further ado, I would like to give the floor to open this conference to Monica Olmeyer, the chair of the Budgetary Control Committee of the European Parliament. Dear participants, dear colleagues, almost 65 years ago, in 1958, at the very beginning of the European integration, there was only one agency the Euratom Supply Agency. Today, the European Union has 43 agencies, some of which are even fully self-financed. In 2021, contributions from the EU general budget to the agencies were approximately 2.8 billion euros, representing 1.7% of the EU budget of that year. So, why do we need the EU agencies? Why do we fund them? Why are they important to the EU and its taxpayers? They are important because of their role, which is to address specific policy needs and to reinforce European cooperation by pooling technical and specialist expertise from the EU and national governments. Decentralized and executive agencies have been helping successfully in preparing and implementing EU policies, especially for technical, scientific, operational and regulatory tasks. Ultimately, they strive for common goals, such as the development of a more sustainable, inclusive and competitive Europe for the benefit of all EU citizens. For example, in the last two years, the agencies in the health and safety cluster have played an important role in the Union's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The ECDC and the EMA have been directly involved in tackling challenges arising from the crisis by monitoring epidemiological data and through the approval of vaccines. Other agencies produced guidance on reducing the risk of contracting the virus in particular sectors, such as the e uh, EASA's COVID-19 Aviation Health Safety Protocol, the European Food Safety Authority's statements on risk of contracting the COVID-19 virus through food, and the European Maritime Safety Agency reports on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on shipping. This was confirmed also by the study on the cost of non-EU agencies focusing on the health and safety cluster of the EU decentralized agencies, according to which seven union agencies in the health and safety field demonstrated strong European added value. And this is widely recognized by member states and other stakeholders, including business stakeholders. Another example is that the Union's Justice and Home Affairs agencies and the important support they provide to the member states in the areas of fundamental rights, border and migration management, security and justice by carrying out operational, analytical, managerial and monitoring tasks. 
We therefore need to ensure adequate financial and human resources to agencies to enable them to fulfill their mandates. Nevertheless, for the CONT Committee and the Parliament, it is very important that EU-funded projects or programs adhere to the principles of sound financial management and that uh, the EU budget is implemented in respect of legality and regularity. Dear participants, dear colleagues, with these principles in mind, agencies' implementation of budget should be subject to effective and efficient internal controls, which should include ex-ante controls aimed at preventing errors and irregularities before operations are authorized. However, in the decentralized agencies, internal controls are not always carried out free of error. The European Court of Auditors has maintained this conclusion in its recent audit reports. For example, weaknesses in public procurement procedures remain the most significant source of irregular payments, with an increase of procurement observations raised by ECHA over the last three years in the last years. ECA has found errors with regard to contract implementation, evaluation of tenders, type of procedure, lack of competition and other. In 2021, for example, approximately 45% of ECA's observations were uh, raised with regard to public procurement procedures. On the other side, there is room for improvement in the agencies. On, the, uh, on one side, uh, we, the politicians, and the Commission have to listen to reoccurring problems in the procurement procedures when it comes to technical changes or enlargement of IT systems being restricted by framework contracts. Moreover, failure to apply effective internal controls in the area of recruitment continues to be reported by ECA. In 2021, the most common weaknesses observed are related to the evaluation process, vacancies, notices, or committees' nominations. According to ECA, improvements are needed also in the field of budgetary management, especially with regard to excessive levels of carryovers in some agencies. In the area of management and control systems that are not linked to procurement or recruitment for 2021, ECA reported 23 weaknesses, including with regard to potential cases of conflict of interest. And when we talk about conflict of interest, we think also of the revolving door phenomena. In this sense, I welcome ECA's initiative to have included in its audit work for 2021 an analysis of how 40 agencies handled potential revolving door situations between 2019 and 2021. ECA reports that only 20 of the 40 agencies examined had considered any potential revolving door cases related to their senior staff. Few agencies go beyond the minimum legal requirements when handling potential revolving doors situations. Most agencies do not engage in monitoring of the professional activity of their senior staff members, including those that have left the agency within the last two years. In this context, I congratulate the nine agencies who had introduced their own rules to deal with the lack of provisions in EU legislation governing the activities of members of agencies, boards, as well as the four agencies who have procedures in place for staff members' compliance with the rules and limitations related to revolving door. Dear participants, dear colleagues, after all these years, we've all noticed that the effectiveness of internal controls remains limited and the protection of the EU's financial interest is hampered when there is no full transparency about the spending of EU funds. But in this area too, the European Parliament has a key role as legislator. We shall strive to improve the existing system of oversight of union funds through a revised financial regulation that will secure a fully-fledged digitalization of the European reporting, monitoring and 
audit. In this context, in 2021, the Parliament has adopted two resolutions with, at their core, a request for a single interoperable reporting and monitoring system that collects data in a standardized way and analyses information on recipients of EU funds and their beneficial owners. Parliament's request has to a large extent been taken over in this year's proposal of the Commission for a revision of EU's financial regulation. We will strongly push in the negotiations for the Council to agree that data will be recorded and uh, stored electronically in an interoperable and machine-readable format for audit and control purposes. This should facilitate more efficient and effective internal controls by the agencies, the Commission, the ECA and possibly OLAF and EPO where applicable. This solution will allow, allow to identify the natural persons that ultimately benefit directly or indirectly from union funding and who ultimately profit from the misuse of EU funds. It will thus facilitate risk assessment for the purposes of selection award, financial management, monitoring investigation, control and audit. It will also enhance the protection of the EU's budget and it will contribute to effective prevention, detection, correction and follow-up of fraud, corruption, conflicts of interest, double funding and other irregularities. It should contribute either to debureaucratization. Going beyond the proposal, of the Commission. Parliament will demand additional functionalities of the integrated digital system to allow the aggregation of data across member states and EU funds so that information concerning the same beneficiary or beneficial owner are combined and analyzed. We would allow a better tracking and tracing of the distribution and possible concentration of EU funds in the hands of a few. The revised financial regulation will generate a positive impact in terms of sound financial management at many levels and for multiple stakeholders, including EU agencies. It will ensure the highest degree possible of respect of the budgetary principles and union values and, ultimately, will increase parliamentary oversight, democratic accountability and transparency. Dear participants, dear colleagues, I would like to conclude by thanking you all, members of the ECA, the Ombudsman, the executive directors and staff of the EU agencies, the representative of Transparency International, for all your work and efforts, contributions to the resilience of our European project in spite of the multiple crises that we've been through. I wish you all fruitful debates, presentations and contributions at this very important event on sound financial management in EU's agencies organized by ECA and the EU agencies. Best wishes for you. Thank you very much, Ms. Holmeyer, for this introductory speech and opening of the event. We will now, in a brief moment, move uh, to the second part of this conference on the role of the EU agencies uh, for the functioning of the European Union and how they contribute to the citizens' daily lives. And welcome back. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, three executive directors of various agencies to join us here live for this um, debate. Uh, first, we have Mr. Fausto Parente, who is the chair of the EU Agencies Network and executive director of the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority. Um, we will also hear from Mr. Rodrigo da Costa, uh, the executive director of the EU Agency for the Space Programme. And last but not least, we will hear from Mr. Hans Bernings, uh, the executive director of the European Environment Agency. Mr. Da, uh, Mr. Parente, forgive me. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I hope you can hear me well. Thanks a lot. And it's a, an honor for me to represent today in a network uh, of agency as the incoming chair of the of the so-called Troika. I want to talk a bit about, um, explain to you what is the network of agency. Um, just to, just to summarize, to, to introduce, the, the, the network is a, an informal body which represent the 49 uh, European decentralized agency and joint undertaking. 
uh, agency and joint undertaking were set up in different moments uh, of our uh, European history to fulfill specific uh, technical or scientific tasks. Um, every, every task of each agency is specified in its founding regulation that, um, that uh, provided for the detailed uh, uh, responsibility we have. The joint undertaking are public-private partnership bodies again set up for uh, the efficient execution of, of some uh, specific uh, tasks sub, such as uh, research, technological development or other programs. The agency or the joint undertaking are um, very different in size. Uh, we can, you can find agency or joint undertaking which are uh, so-called small, more than uh, around 30 staff member and other which are quite, quite big, close to 1,500 staff members. The majority of us are financed by the European, uh, by the European budget. Uh, a few of us are, are also financed with the, via partially or totally via fees uh, collected by the supervised uh, entity concerned. Uh, despite this, uh, let's say, informal uh, setup of the network of agency, we uh, have decided already time ago to to be committed to 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 to, to reach uh, uh, excellence in the in the administrative in, in in the administration. We set up uh, time ago a seven-year strategy, and we our ambition with the ambition the objective to really excel and to be a role model in terms of uh, administrative excellence. Uh, as I said, I am the incoming chair. Uh, the, the implementation of the strategy is facilitated via the, the so-called Troika. So the chair of the, the network uh, for is a is a rotation. Uh, the, the task is a, is an rotation basis. So every year we change we change chair, and the Troika is the sum of the chair of the here, the incoming and the outcoming chair. So this is uh, now we are uh, entering in the in the next year as uh, the the IOPA to be to to be the chair. So this is why I'm here today as incoming chairs. The Troika facilitate the implementation of the of the strategy, facilitate the way in which we want to achieve uh, our objective. Now the I said that it's a uh, <clears throat> to uh, 49 uh, agency. If you can uh, switch on the slide number three, maybe uh, just to, to show the, the, the countries in which uh, there are agency. The total uh, number of agency uh, may be perceived as uh, quite high, but it's, um, it's spread all over Europe. Uh, and this proximity to people is uh, one of the, the, the many added value of uh, the setting up of different agencies. So I, I wonder if we all know which country has uh, which uh, agency and uh, if the citizens of the different country are aware of the existence of, of the agency in their own countries. Uh, here you may see the map. The map shows that um, we are spread in 24 European countries. There is still uh, there is there are still a few that miss uh, an agency. Maybe this will come. Um, and um, just to say that we perform a very different task. Uh, maybe one uh, one uh, one way to to explain the existence of the of the agency is to 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 try to understand why they were created. I will later on explain a bit what uh, what we did what it was done in the in the financial area, but a significant number of uh, agencies were created actually in response of some, for example, some crisis. In, in our case, uh, the financial sector is uh, the outcome uh, of the of the crisis, the global crisis 2028. 20, uh, similarly, um, the Frontex agency, the, the asylum agency are uh, in response to migration issue or border control. Similarly, also the Maritime Safety Agency uh, and the Fisheries Control Agency are in response to some, uh, to, to some uh, issues in that area. So there is an history behind each, uh, each of us. What is important, this is common for all of us, is that the, the link, the vital, the vital link with the, the, between the European institution and the citizen is, uh, is very important for all of us. And this, as I said, is the proximity with the with the people uh, is uh, the, the one of the very, very added value 
of the agency. If we go to, to, to the next slide, uh, I would like just to mention uh, the, the, the possible clusterization of each of us. Uh, this is one way to present us uh, per area, let's say, per area of, uh, of um, activities. Uh, so you can find here the area of freedom, security and justice, where uh, the already mentioned Frontex uh, Asylum uh, perform their job. The supervisory responsibility is another area, and here uh, the financial sector, uh, we as a job, but our colleagues, uh, EBA, SRB, ESMA, are the the agency active to, to defend uh, and to protect consumers in the financial system. Then uh, there is a third group of uh, agencies which are mandated to provide uh, um, to provide help in defense and foreign securities. Uh, a fourth group can be seen as uh, working on the innovation side, on the helping the business, support the business. Um, the, there are uh, a, a, first, a first area maybe is also um, grouping the one like the medicine, the medicine area or the agency for the fundamental rights, so to foster citizen uh, well-being. This is one way to group uh, all the different kind of activity we perform. There can be other ways, but uh, it's important to understand and to explain that plenty of the different activity can be grouped together, uh, but there are also common line in terms of administration that uh, um, that um, can be can accumulate of all uh, all uh, all the different activities. If I look at uh, in the next slide, maybe if I look at uh, uh, our baby area, the the, the financial sector, uh, we were set up as I said in response of the global crisis of the 2008. So we were born in the 2010 actually and became operationally the next year 2011. Uh, this was the the reaction or the 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 answer to the global financial crisis. We were set up. Uh, to look at the possible impact in terms of the system and the real economy of the, the crisis in the financial sector. We looked at the three sectors, the, the banks, the market, the financial market, insurance and pension. So EBA for the bank, EOPA for pension and insurance, and ESMA for the financial market. Uh, we look at the, the, the sector from a so-called the micro perspective, meaning the stability of each entity. But of course, there is there are um, possibility of contagion across border, across uh, uh, sector, uh, and this uh, possible contagion, uh, as it happened uh, in, uh, in, the, in the global financial crisis, may become systemic. So this means that the system of the European uh, um, supervisory authority as a, as a whole uh, works together. Uh, this include uh, is based on the three ag agency that I mentioned, EBA, EBA, um, EOPA and ESMA, but also include the national authorities, uh, the ESRB, the European Systemic Risk Board, and they and and we work together to to really understand and detect uh, each and every possible uh, issue in terms of system financial system. We work together also in, uh, in a specific body, which is uh, the joint committee, uh, which collects actually, there is a governance in which we, we put together all our effort. Um, another part of the, of the system is also related to the single resolution board. The single resolution board works on the banking side, the bank which are already in difficulty. So this means that for an, an ordered resolution of the uh, bank which are in difficulty we set up um, the, the the body the single resolution board which deals with um, an order at the uh, exit let's say of the bank from the financial sector this to avoid again uh, systemic uh, consequences so this is a bit uh, the um, the way in which uh, uh, the the way in which they, the, the the financial sector the European system of financial supervision was set up. If you go to the next slide, maybe uh, just um, uh, a couple of words on what we concretely then we do. Uh, you can see in the slide the list of activities. So we develop uh, uh, the single rule book because the the single market 
necessitate a single rule book. So the way in which uh, the business is performed uh, should be set up in the same way wherever uh, the entity, the financial entity is located. But on top of the single rule book, there is a need for a common application of the same rule. So there is a need to converge in terms of supervisory approaches, supervisory practices. And this is uh, another important area where uh, where we work um, together to, to enhance the quality of the supervision and to have a similar, a similar treatment and similar protection of the different uh, consumers. We work a lot on uh, the, the, the word consumers here is quite important. We work a lot to protect uh, our, um, our citizen. Um, the value the value added is exactly on on what we concretely can do for them to to understand how the business is done not only in terms of stability of the financial entity but also in terms of how the business is performed how the clients the, the consumer the investors um, are treated uh, if they are treated fairly if the practices are um, are done and are um, acted in the best uh, uh, interest of the clients uh, uh, and if they are protected in general. This is a, a, a way in which we work and maybe one uh, last word in the in the next slide, please, is uh, about the, the way in which we also improve, let's say. The, the network member value the work of the European Court of Auditors uh, very much, it's, it's very seriously taken each and every recommendation we receive. We see this partnership as um, the basis for a continuous improvement. Uh, I can say also that there were a good result overall in terms of uh, uh, compliance from our side. Uh, the, the fact is also that we want to continuously improve. So the receiving recommendation and working together to check and detect which area we can um, better implement is a common goal between us and the court of auditors that we it is very close to our heart in terms of future consideration we very much appreciated the recently um, more focused approach on the performance uh, this is quite important for us because it, it, we want to go beyond the, the, the let's say the, the compliance we want to excel in terms of uh, performance in, in all, the, in all their, the, the aspect of the performance, we want to deliver good product to the citizens and to the, the European people. So this means that the compliance is part of it, but we also want to go further. We also want to achieve excellence in, in, each, uh, in each and every area. So the focus on the performance uh, is very much appreciated. Of course, uh, there is uh, also, let's say, an acknowledgement that in the current uh, rapid uh, 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 fast movement of the technology of the economic condition the the political developments uh, that we are facing uh, there is a need also to be agile in terms of organization our governance our method our uh, approaches to work should be agile should be flexible this means uh, not only flexibility in terms of resources uh, to be managed, but also in terms of policy. We want to help the, the co-legislator or the policy maker to, to have uh, the, uh, the fit for purpose uh, approaches in each and every area. So the involvement in all the phases of the policy cycle can be an added value from a technical point of view that the, the network of agency can provide in the different area we are, we are working on. So let's, uh, let me conclude saying that the, the area of excellence in the, in the different tasks we perform can be a, a key factor of success. And all the, the expertise that are developed in the different agency and the joint undertaking can make a, um, a, a really a, a step further, can allow the, the, poli the, the, the political level to make a step further if we contribute to each and every step of the policy cycle and let's use the center of expertise that that uh, that we have in the different uh, agency and uh, joint undertaking i i will uh, stop here and of course happy to to react to, to any comments thanks a lot thank you mr parente indeed compliance is one thing performance added value 
agility, uh, some of the key words I, I take from your, your presentation. I would like to give the floor now to Mr. Uh, da Costa, the um, Executive Director of the Agency for the Space Program. Mr. Da Costa. Thank you very much. Also from my side, thank you for uh, uh, inviting me uh, to this event today. Um, I will be quite brief. Um, I just want to give you a couple of examples uh, uh, to our audience about how agencies are contributing to citizens, uh, to the daily life of uh, the citizens. And I will focus, of course, uh, in particular uh, on the uh, EU space program uh, and the activities of uh, my agency, the European Union Agency for the Space Program. And the next slide shows you very briefly what the EU space program is about. Um, uh, in many ways, uh, space is becoming part of our daily lives. And certainly one way or the other, uh, you may have already heard about the efforts uh, of the European Union in space, being it in the, in the domain of satellite navigation with programs such as Galileo and EGNOS, now fully operational and delivering value to uh, citizens and to businesses. But as well, uh, Earth observation. Earth observation, a very important matter uh, to understand not only what is the current status and what is the history of the evolution uh, of our Earth, for example, in things um, like uh, climate challenges and uh, environmental evolutions, but also to help the prediction of how this will go ahead. Uh, and then other areas such as uh, secured communication, space situational awareness and many other domains and all these domains um, are driven by the European Union within one program and um, the EU space program the next slide shows you what our agency is doing in that uh, uh, EU space program and basically we are covering three different missions the mission of exploitation of the systems. This basically means the maintenance, the operations, the evolution, the protection of the infrastructure. This means the satellites, the ground infrastructure, and making sure that they work and operate and provide services 24 hours a day, seven days per week. In addition to those tasks that we have already, also new tasks are coming our way when it comes in particular to a very up-to-date topic, uh, the topic of space surveillance and tracking, basically understanding the environment in space where our satellites uh, and our systems operate. Second domain of activity of our agencies in the domain of security. Security, which means making sure that the systems are secure, yes, and are protected, but also that space, space data, space services can be used for security related uh, missions. And by the way, be it in the domain of safety or of security, space has a growing application. Last but not least, and I will focus the, 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 the last part of my, my brief intervention on that, is everything that is related to uh, market development, communications, user uptake, innovation, entrepreneurship, which basically means how to react the benefits of the investments into concrete benefits to citizens and to the different sectors of our society. Now, uh, as you may imagine, space contributes to ve uh, very wide domains, uh, certainly, and um, Many of you have uh, space on your cell phone, will have space in your car through your navigation device. You see space images whenever you look at the weather forecast, etc., etc. So there is quite a large impact uh, on the society. The next chart, the next slide shows uh, the market segmentation that we have done. So we have looked at the applications of space and we have identified 17 different areas of our economy and of our society to which space uh, provides benefits uh, sometimes larger benefits sometimes smaller benefits but in all of them there is a tendency uh, for growth of space and these are very uh, varied uh, market areas or segments you have things like aviation transport maritime road transport but also agriculture uh, and forestry, uh, insurance and finance, um, and uh, energy management, of course. So many other, many different areas, in total 17, uh, on which space can provide uh, benefits. And then 
as a EU agency. We are indeed working with the tools that we have. Those are, of course, financing tools through Horizon Europe, through program budget, but also tools such as coaching tools, um, such as uh, providing expertise to the downstream actors in order to develop solutions, in order to develop applications that then re the benefits uh, in terms of uh, utilization and, of course, as well, um, economic growth. We do that always very well aligned with the priorities of the Union, be it the Green Deal, the digitalization, uh, resilience or strategic autonomy. And I've brought to you two concrete examples because uh, I don't want to be speaking in the air. I try to find concrete examples that are very up to date uh, uh, in the days that we are living right now. The next chart shows one of those, which is how space can help and how space is supporting, um, for example, the area of renewable energy. Uh, and, and this is quite wide because this includes for manage, management of the energy networks and support to the management of the uh, energy networks. Also, what is the environmental impact, for example, of certain forms of renewable en energy, uh, providing the appropriate market intelligence, helping, for example, on the co-location, the best places, the best spots uh, to have wind turbines, to have solar uh, uh, solar farms, uh, etc., etc. All these can be done, for example, with images gathered from space. But also after these uh, renewable energy installations have been put in place, space can help us, for example, in the monitoring. There are uh, right now, uh, the uh, applications going on on the usage of drones using precise positioning from satellites in order to, ins to inspect solar panels, in order to inspect wind turbines. So there the loop closes as well. And you see that in such a up-to-date area such as energy uh, and in particular all the efforts of the Union to move forward with renewable energy, space can have a contribute to the value chain. My last example is in the last chart, and this is also not only to show um, a, a particular uh, application, but also to demonstrate that EU agencies can be very reactive bodies, because we have tools, we have means also to act quickly when it is necessary. We have started a couple of months ago an initiative that we call EU Space for Ukraine. Uh, and this is basically a platform that we have put together, uh, bringing uh, together on the one hand NGOs, so people that are on the field supporting the humanitarian uh, situation uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and on the other hand, we've brought together entrepreneurs and innovators, people that can provide solutions that know the technologies. And basically the idea and the beginning of the idea was to do some matchmaking between uh, what are the needs of NGOs in the fields and what can the innovators and entrepreneurs of the European Union, moderated by an agency, bring together where are the contact points. Well, I can already anticipate that uh, this, of course, the work is ongoing, but already concrete applications um, have been found, and now the NGOs and entrepreneurs are working together in providing solutions. So I think this is a quite uh, practical example example, and by the way, also in terms of reactivity, because this was something that we were able of putting together in a very short time as a reaction uh, to uh, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the humanitarian crisis, crisis that generated from that. So with this, I will close. Once again, I will thank uh, for the invitation uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Da Costa, uh, for this uh, vast presentation and giving us an overview of the activities of the uh, Space Program uh, Agency. Uh, I would like to move now to uh, the last uh, participant for this part of the conference, Mr. Hans Brönings, the Executive Director of the European Environment Agency, who will give us an overview of the activities of the agency. Mr. Brönings. Good morning. Uh, colleagues, it's a pleasure to be with you. I am here to speak on behalf of those agencies that are working in the field of health and environment, two uh, concerns that are really close to European citizens, as we also know from the Euro barometer. When we speak about those fields, I think the agencies together have a number of tasks that add value at the European level. One is, of course, that we are involved in uh, supporting the whole policy cycle. First of all, in implementation, we do a lot of the monitoring 
and reporting that needs to happen under the Aki and the developing legislation. We are responsible sometimes for authorization and market access. We are responsible for, for risk assessments and to make analyses in the fields that we work in. We also provide expertise in other parts of uh, the policy cycle. When policies are developing, our experts often contribute to expert committees that are preparing new policies proposals or do policy evaluation of a variety of types. We do that, of course, with the European Commission, but also with the European Parliament and often also in support of presidency priorities. A second thing that we do is, of course, making the link with the member states in our areas. We are often the ones that make the connection to the national authorities in our domains. We create efficiency gains by standardizing monitoring and reporting tools, by providing the Internet infrastructure uh, for that. We do capacity building in cases where member states are uh, needing that. And we provide networks of learning about policy implementation. A third element uh, that we provide is the link with the scientific community. I think Europe is clearly uh, a continent where we want knowledge to drive policy developments. We want to stay at the forefront of that. And increasingly, we also want to bring science and knowledge in terms of foresight to face future challenges. Well, our agency's cluster is clearly working with scientific committees and scientific panels. We often also have a large proportion of scientifically trained staff. And in our domains, we work together with the Joint Research Center and are making connections with the investments that the EU makes under uh, research and innovation programs. So that is another uh, thing we do. We recently uh, met in Barcelona with our network and we had a serious discussion about how we could maybe get even more out of uh, the agencies as a network. And I would like to start with the observation that most of us uh, have been set up uh, to perform tasks at requests of institutions, but mostly in a rather one-on-one -on -one relationship with a partner DG. Now, uh, that was probably the best setup when we were still dealing with a rather fragmented response to societal challenges, but increasingly science but also the European policy framing is calling for what you could call more systemic and integrated responses, connecting the dots. And I think uh, agencies are doing that already in our domain. We are collaborating with the agencies around the One Health uh, concept uh, in support of Farm to Fork, in support of the Chemical Strategy and Zero Pollution Action Plan, risk assessment methods that are shared. So that type of collaboration is already there. But I think we could get more out of the agencies if we would be approached as a system of knowledge networks and a system that provides a knowledge architecture to underpin the increasingly integrated European policy agenda. And it is fair to say that uh, the enthusiasm when we spontaneously collaborate on issues is not always uh, equally big with our Brussels partners when we do that. So I think there could be a stronger stimulation of that type of collaboration to get more out of the agencies than we do today. And since we are also in the European Court of Auditors setting today, I would like to refer to a recent report where the European Court of Auditors mentioned 1 billion uh, euros a year going to consultants in the EU system. That is about, I would say, the budget of 10 medium-sized agencies, if I can make that comparison. I think uh, we as an agency's network could actually perform quite a number of the tasks that are outsourced if we are approached in uh, a way that, that gives us a mandate and uh, are we requested to do these tasks. Because these consultants often uh, end up uh, picking up the phone, contacting us, and actually using the analysis, the data, 
and also our staff time to do the work that they then have to do. So uh, I, I hope you uh, apologize my rather forward uh, way of putting that on the table. But since you are talking about resource use and added value, I think it's fair to say that agencies could probably play a stronger role uh, at that stage of uh, policy support as well. I thank you for uh, listening and uh, uh, I wish you a very fruitful set of deliberations on the role of agencies in the EU system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burnings. I'll, I'll take the uh, need to be a network of uh, knowledge uh, as one of the main messages, not only in environment but also in health issues, being quite an important um, matter. Um, thank you to Mr. Parente, Da Costa and Burnings for their presentation. They gave us a an overview of what the agency do uh, with concrete examples and, and certainly uh, forecasts for the future that looks rather promising. Um, we will now, uh, in a brief moment, move to uh, the next part of our presentation or our conference, which uh, will deal with the performance of the agencies. How have they performed? Uh, the Court of Auditors has published the annual report for the financial year 2021 on the agencies. In a few moments, we'll get back to you with that part of the conference. Uh, welcome back uh, to the, this next part of the conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Rimanta Satchus, the reporting member for this year's annual report on uh, the agencies for the financial year 2021. Uh, Mr. Satchus, what are the main, mes main messages that we should take home from this year's report? Thank you, Fabrice, uh, for giving me uh, the floor. Uh, of course, uh, now we will be talking about probably more boring things uh, or uh, the things that could seem more boring to, to many. Uh, uh, but uh, I want to start uh, with a slide uh, that uh, was used uh, just minutes ago by Fausto Parente. Uh, he described very perfectly uh, this constellation of uh, European institutions uh, and their role and their scale. Uh, I will not come back to that. Uh, let me, not as an auditor, probably as a European citizen, to note one thing that is the most outstanding uh, uh, just for me is geographical diversity. Geographical diversity means that agencies are all there with the European citizen. Uh, and this is good for the European Union, of course, uh, but it comes at a price. This face of the European Union, of European Union uh, uh, governance, uh, should be decent. And this is what uh, the auditors care. Uh, we did and published today uh, the audit report on uh, 44 agencies. Uh, 44, this was the number of agencies in this constellation last year. It is quite dynamic uh, because uh, uh, last year we had uh, arrival of several agencies, including some very important, like European Public Prosecutor's Office, uh, office uh, but also departure of one executive agency from Luxembourg. Uh, uh, it was closed and its functions uh, given to other executive agencies. Agencies, uh, I also have to note, uh, they are of three kinds, and the audit is also very specific for them. These are, most of them, they are decentralized agencies implementing European policies. There are now six executive agencies who manage big uh, flows of uh, European money from European uh, uh, budget uh, that uh, are, are, are spent by the European Commission. And there are uh, so-called uh, special bodies, uh, among which one, one of the bodies I would uh, note, the Single Resolution Board, uh, the body with uh, uh, very important functions. But about functions, Fausto Parente has told quite a lot. Now the health check of the agencies. I'm really happy to report to you that uh, the situation overall is good. Uh, we give three, three opinions normally, uh, one on the accounts of the agencies, and uh, it is... Uh, uh, positive, clean, as we call across the board. Uh, on revenues, we also are happy with, the, with the, how the revenues came. Uh, we didn't see big errors there. All uh, accounts, all, all, all revenues, all agencies are clean. And one yellow card to one agency, as you see from the slide, one qualified opinion, 
uh, associated with the public procurement. Uh, but I think this will be also the matter that will be discussed in the, uh, uh, some in the second next panel. Uh, uh, along with the opinions, we also issue observations, so-called observations. And probably agency people, they know that these are, uh, despite clean opinion given by the Court of Auditors, this is something that should be worked upon. 77 observations, they are critical observations for 33 agencies. Uh, half of them concerns public procurement. So in fact, public procurement, uh, it is European money. Sometimes we can count even how much the error cost. Uh, and uh, depending on this cost, if it is uh, exceeding the materiality threshold, we have to qualify our opinion. Uh, so this uh, is uh, this still remains the problem. What we also check, uh, we uh, check uh, fair and transparent recruitment. Uh, recruitment for agencies uh, is very important, and, and really I think it is very important work that uh, our auditors do, because uh, uh, unfair recruitment can also lead very practically to litigation in the courts, uh, to some problems, human problems, including human problems. So uh, we should avoid uh, and we should correct, uh, uh, correct uh, the, uh, vacancy, uh, the, the defects of vacancy notices, evaluation, evaluation processes, and things like that. Uh, budgetary management, management control systems, these are things, by the way, that were mentioned at the very beginning of the conference uh, by uh, Monica Holmeyer, the chair of the Cont Committee. I will not go very deep to that. Let me stop on two issues, just on two issues. And first, and first is public procurement. Uh, public procurement, of course, should ensure fair competition and the best value for money. And of course, to limit uh, fraud risks, uh, to limit, of course, you can't avoid fully the fraud because, uh, because well, it is, it is not realistic, but uh, the procedures, the procedures should both prevent fraud but also not to overload uh, uh, the uh, activities of the agencies because complexity of the procedures is another issue that can cause errors, errors uh, uh, observed by the auditors, uh, which, uh, which in fact, uh, well, then uh, can lead to qualified opinion, not very clean uh, opinion of the auditors about, about the agency. Um, it is, as I said, is most frequent error. Um, and this slide, uh, may I joke, uh, there is right part of the slide that is made of very small letters and very detailed things. Uh, I think in public procurement, there are big things that we should think about. And I'm, I, I hope uh, the second panel uh, will, will uh, come back to that. Uh, improving procurement uh, procedures. Specific versus framework contracts. There is the most common uh, problem that is sometimes is very difficult to overcome, and sometimes probably not because of the guilt of the agency itself. Uh, financial regulation is very important. I would say that there are two uh, two sides of the coin. Uh, first implementation of the procedures in the agencies that should be improved, no question about that. But I would say, I would call to, uh, legislators uh, to think about improving legislation. As I said, simplifying the procedures in the legislation could, as auditors believe, uh, lead to less errors. Uh, governance issues and conflict of interest. And here we have quite a lot, uh, quite a, uh, a lot to tell. We mentioned in this annual report something that we already observed in our previous special reports: uh, the uh, governance of uh, uh, EU agencies that do have the boards. And we think that the very presence of the board, functioning of the board, is prone to conflicts of interests and, and the ethical issues should be very specifically and much more closely looked at. Uh, governance uh, structure of supervisory authorities, for example, that Fausto also mentioned, this EIOPA, uh, European Securities Market Authority, ESMA, and uh, last but not least, Banking Authority, uh, is an issue. Uh, there we should, should ensure persistence of European interest instead of national. 
And despite that, in the very recent uh, report dealing with anti-money laundering, uh, the Court of Auditors obtained written evidence of lobbying during the discussion in European Banking Authority that is responsible for this area of policy, uh, lobbying not to open the breach of uh, union law uh, procedure. And this procedure wasn't open. Uh, of course, the person concerned cannot participate in the decision making, but there are no rules that would prevent that person to be in the room when the uh, things are discussed. So we should delimit national influence and European decision taking, uh, not uh, to risk uh, the trust of uh, not only businesses, but also wide public uh, to, the, uh, work, uh, to the work of the agencies. Uh, revolving doors was uh, another issue that will be discussed in particular in the, in the uh, panel just uh, after my presentation. Uh, we decided to look into that because uh, of the signals from the press. There is also an important uh, stimulus for auditors to start looking into some issues. Uh, and what we see, a revolving door phenomenon, it is departure of the public sector employees to the private sector, not always. Uh, not all departures are bad, but those that could create conflict of interest and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, could uh, uh, lead to uh, improper advocating and lobbying against the interests of the European Union, in this case, there is something that we should prevent. And we looked into, into the uh, legislative picture and in concrete functioning of the mechanisms. So we do have in the agency staff members that comply with the staff regulations. And the staff regulation for those who probably are not so proficient in the European legislation, it is a kind of labor code of the European institutions. There's a very important uh, legislation. And it uh, implies uh, some rules uh, that uh, not only senior, but also all staff, non-senior, all staff should observe uh, to, uh, to undergo this so-called cooling period of two years after they departed uh, from, the, uh, from the agency. But, but also outside activities, parallel activities of people working for the uh, European institutions is another problem because it is quite widespread. Uh, so general revolving door uh, rules for departing people, they are there in staff regulations. In a moment, I will tell what we found there. But we have non-staff, and these are board members. Board members, they do not belong to the European staff, to the staff of the agencies. It is above. Uh, uh, and uh, for the board members, uh, uh, we saw the picture much, much worse. Uh, of course, what we didn't look into, these are members of scientific committees, expert groups, perhaps uh, the talk will come back to these people during, during the panel. It might be, but uh, in this audit, we didn't look into that, but ethical standards and not mixing interests of, uh, of the uh, scientific expert um, uh, participating in the decision in the agency uh, and also being uh, the, the, the participant of the, of the um, uh, scientific research in some firm that produced, the, for example, the drug the, that, uh, that uh, uh, should be approved or not by European medical agency, as an example, is a problem. Now, boards. Uh, departure of the members of the boards. Board members are much uh, shorter serving people than the staff of European agencies. Of course, there are many contract staff in the European agencies. They also serve uh, for a shorter period. But board members, they arrive and depart much more frequently. And uh, you see, uh, for board members, there are no general rules uh, in the European legislation. Nine agencies on their own behalf seeing the importance of avoiding uh, conflict of interest uh, among board members, they introduced their own, their own rules uh, in place, uh, regulating uh, both departure and outside activities. But you, you can compare the uh, scale of the problem. For senior staff, as I mentioned, there is legislation 
There is legislation, the European legislation, there is something, rules to follow, but for board members, none. And board number of departures, and this is analysis of 2019, 2021, uh, more, uh, more than 600 departures, uh, the board members, uh, and only 25 cases were formally analyzed by the rules approved by nine agencies. There is almost nothing. In senior staff, it is different. So we recommend, we recommend first for agencies that they all should introduce their internal rules for members of their boards. And some agencies have good practice and the network of agencies, I think, can share this good experience. But we also call for the legislators, for the commission to initiate uh, and uh, the European Parliament and the council to approve the rule for board members uh, which come uh, in many cases from national institutions. So uh, this is uh, really uh, a very urgent issue uh, to harmonize minimum set of rules. Of course, agencies are very different and probably the nature of conflicts is quite different, but the harmonized minimum set of rules should be there. In EU agencies, we checked some cases. Uh, I sh can say that those 20 agencies that uh, do examine the, uh, the departures of their senior staff, and we can find ourself, ourselves on senior staff and their departures from the agencies, whether this senior staff declared to the agency uh, their future employment, uh, whether got approval of the agency that has analyzed a possible, po possible presence or absence uh, of the conflict of interest, uh, um, only 20 agencies did that. We found some uh, small issues, but probably today not the time to go to these uh, small issues. Uh, what we uh, see that probably, uh, probably we encounter, we see the tip of the iceberg. Tip of the iceberg, because uh, uh, there can be different situations. I'm not stating that they are there, because nobody knows, nobody studied this phenomenon. When people uh, uh, do not declare their departure um, uh, and employment in the private sector uh, during these two years, or uh, employment in the second place during uh, these two years, or they do not declare some of their professional activities, professional, well, uh, delivering lectures, participating in the scientific research or whatever, along in parallel with the functions uh, in, the, in the agencies. What we ask the agencies to improve uh, is uh, uh, introduce the methods of active monitoring of such cases. Of course, there is nothing totalitarian can be, can be foreseen. Uh, I think it is simply given the resources, limited resources of the agencies is not possible. But uh, sampling the cases or some uh, sample check I think uh, could work, the more so that uh, I know in some agencies uh, uh, they have uh, begun uh, working on that. Our observations, uh, observa as, as, as I said, along with the positive opinions, we have these uh, sometimes nasty observations, uh, and we uh, look every year how these observations are worked upon, how the defects uh, that we observe, they, uh, they are rectified, and what action is taken uh, by the agencies. Uh, I can say that uh, from a total of uh, last year, 140 that were, uh, uh, were dealt with, uh, uh, half of that uh, were completed. So I frankly thank uh, to the agency's administration, to the agencies, uh, and the commission, of course, who takes care of the agency's uh, management uh, for completing, for taking, uh, taking into, uh, into their attention observations and correcting the situation. Ongoing work, of course, there are issues that cannot be done in one year or sometimes the issues uh, that simply do not belong to the competence of the agencies. Uh, but mm, I, think, uh, I think we are on the right path uh, and uh, overall, as I said, uh, uh, the results uh, to my mind uh, of the agency's audit are quite positive. Uh, and uh, I will, uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, happiness, uh, uh, well, and with hope, uh, see to the next years. But audit reports can serve, although they are, as I said, quite detailed. Uh, I think they can serve for igniting the discussion on a much wider horizon, much wider scale. 
And that is why I wish the two next panels that will be dealing with our findings as a beginning point uh, to generate good ideas and uh, to deliver something that nobody expected in these panels. Uh, Fabrice, uh, I give over to you and wish uh, the both two panels that uh, are following uh, very good discussion, very productive, uh, productive thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sachs, for this presentation on the annual report uh, for the agencies. Um, indeed, two topics, revolving doors, conflict of interest, and of course, procurement. Um, we will look at them during those two next panel discussions, so we will get back uh, shortly with the first panel discussion. And welcome back to this conference and the first panel discussion on revolving doors, how to ensure the independence of key staff in the interest of citizens. We will have an overview on the work done. We will look at the challenges for the agencies and their experience. And we will see if there is a need for better rules. If you want to find more about the findings in this year's annual report, you can go to page 50 and the following ones. I welcome in the studio Mr. Uh, Mikhail Skoslovs, um, member of the European Court of Auditors, and for this panel discussion we will also be joined uh, by the European Ombudsman, uh, Mrs. Emily O'Reilly, um, Mr. Fausto Parente, who was also there in the first part of the conference from the, uh, from the agency, um, sorry, of the, uh, the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority. We will also be joined by uh, François, uh, Jean François Louis Michaud, the Executive Director of the European Banking Authority, and last but not least, we will be joined by Mr. Vito Teixeira from Transparency International. Uh, thank you all for being with us in this panel discussion. I would like to start uh, with my, my guest in the studio here, Mr. Uh, Koslovs. The European Court of Auditors has done quite a bit of uh, work on conflict of interest in the recent past, and this time for EU agencies on revolving doors. Now, why is this so important and what are uh, the main risks? Yes, uh, thank you, Fabrice. And, uh, First of all, thanks to my colleagues, uh, Rimanta, Sajus, and other colleagues at the court uh, for organizing this, this event. I think it's really timely and it's never, uh, uh, it's never late to look at, uh, or never enough rather, to look at the issues of uh, revolving doors and conflict of interest. So the choice of topic, I think, is, is, is excellent. Um, ethics is, uh, is an eternal matter. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm also obviously pleased to be uh, part of such an experienced and distinguished panel, although many colleagues are not uh, not here, but still uh, I am uh, very pleased to be here. So let me maybe start with a with, with couple of basic basic uh, thoughts that I would like to share uh, with with you. Uh, uh, we all know that citizens uh, expect uh, public servants to manage public interests, to manage public resources. Uh, properly on a daily basis and to make um, individual decisions uh, uh, independently of any past, current or uh, future considerations. And this, I think, uh, will ensure fair and reliable public services, uh, also predictable decision making and importantly, uh, also will inspire public trust. I think public trust is, is a key concept also for the Court of Auditors that goes also beyond uh, you know, beyond the the, uh, the agency's issue as as such. Uh, <clears throat> next, I think um, what we also um, saw in the last couple of years that um, any weakness uh, in this respect may and actually do very often result uh, in an irreparable reputational damage to the image of the EU and these institutions. And this is uh, you know where I see uh, the main problem. Um, even if a society might not be uh, concerned by behavior of an, of an individual, uh, some you know, departing individual from, from the EU institutions, uh, the case of unethical behavior is very quickly, uh, in, you know, which in fact might not be even representative. In, in many cases, uh, it is extrapolated uh, immediately to the whole population. And that's where the, the image of the EU institution is, is being harmed. And also, we shouldn't forget uh, that unethical behavior can also be part of or ca can be linked to risks of uh, corruption and um, fraud. And uh, therefore, uh, the media, various stakeholders, and the general public uh, have been particularly interested uh, about the cases of revolving doors and uh, the seeming, 
seeming, I would like to maybe underline, seeming inability of the EU institutions uh, to limit the risk that such situation actually actually occur. And, and I think, uh, to, with all due respect, I think they, they do ask a very legitimate question. Uh, is it business as usual uh, in, the, in the EU institutions? Is it, is it business as usual? So the next question I would like to introduce very briefly, uh, what about our action? What, what can we do? Uh, and I think uh, the, the first simple question to answer for all of us is, uh, and for all the, the involved parties in a, potential, in, in a potential situation, is whether uh, a departure of, of an employee constitutes uh, a perceived potential or even actual conflict of interest. And I think preferably this answer um, should be answered by the employee, first of all, and by uh, his or her organization. And that's where I think we should put the emphasis. Prevention is, I think, key in this respect. And obviously, it can be done also on, um, on a permanent basis. So I, I would like just to mention maybe two points. First of all, uh, to promote ethical behavior. Um, through legal rules, uh, through ethical standards that should, should underpin, and I think importantly, very important that we also find uh, you know, in some of our work, they should go beyond the minimum uh, legal requirements that exist in some, uh, in some uh, EU legislation. So, um, and probably a, a, a future proof, uh, a future proof approach uh, is strengthening the ethics culture within organization, especially, uh, I'd like to underline this, especially by leading by example from the top managers of the institution. I think, uh, I mean, this is, this, is, this is never enough, this is never enough. And the second uh, point uh, that was also mentioned, I think, uh, by my colleague Rimantas in, in, in the previous session, is that uh, there is a need clearly for regular risk assessment, uh, implementation, careful implementation of the rules and monitoring. Uh, and I think uh, these, these can, be, can be very helpful. And these are the reasons, to answer your question Fabrice, these are the reasons why at the court we keep uh, the issue of, um, of ethics in broader terms, in various, in various aspects, in various dimensions of this concept, uh, under more or less constant review when we publish uh, you know, regularly uh, our products on, on this matter. And just, uh, you know, in the framework of this first uh, set of comments, I, I would like to mention also one of the audits. Uh, I think it was the first audit on uh, some selected agencies that we published uh, exactly 10 years ago, where the court concluded uh, that uh, none of the selected agencies adequately managed the conflict of interest situation. Of course, we recognized that uh, the shortcomings were of uh, varying, uh, you know, varying degrees. And back in time, we put forward um, recommendations to the selected agencies. And importantly, I think this is important, and this is the link to maybe my, my second intervention, we also uh, invited all other uh, agencies and institutions to pay attention to the matter. So I would come maybe uh, uh, in more detail to these points in my second intervention or in the discussion. And I would like to uh, uh, stop here, Fabrice. Thank you very much. And thanks for your attention, obviously, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Koslos. Um, <coughs> I would like to switch to uh, Emily O'Reilly. Um, as the EU Ombudsman, you have also done a lot of work on revolving doors uh, and revolving doors issues. How do you see the bigger picture uh, and, and what were your most important findings? Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'd like to begin by commending the uh, Court of Auditors on, on their contribution to this uh, this particular uh, issue, it's, it's very important. And um, if I want to make it a general overarching statement, I'll say that the most important thing here is influencing cultural change in relation to this. You can have all the rules and regulations that you wish. If they're not enforced, they won't work. But more than that, if you don't have a leadership at the top of agencies, at the top of the administration, that sees the problems that are caused by the revolving doors, um, then nothing will change. So the most important thing is that there is leadership in relation to this and that the leadership absolutely understands why it's important and that the leadership does whatever it needs to do in order to make sure that the sort of scandals and cases that we've heard of in recent years simply never happen. And as the, the last speaker said, and I fully agree, this goes to 
uh, you know, the heart of the integrity of the EU and indeed the legitimacy of the EU. Uh, and, and I have seen the impact of, of, of just a single case on how that can be exploited by people who are hostile to the EU or who are Eurosceptical. Let me give you one example of a case that, that we um, investigated several years ago. Many of you that the former president of the commission, Mr. Barroso, after 18 months after he had office, joined uh, Goldman Sachs. And Goldman Sachs, as you know, had been very heavily and negatively uh, implicated in the financial crisis on both sides of, of the Atlantic. And that case got a lot of publicity, obviously, because of uh, Goldman Sachs is a, is a big name globally. Also, the president of the commission is, is, is a big main a name, a big player within the EU administration, obviously, and also essentially globally as well. And that happened around the time that, that Brexit was happening and the, uh, the UK referendum, to, which eventually led to them leaving the, the EU. And I could see how that particular case was leapt upon and exploited by, for example, Mr. Nigel Farage, who led the charge of formerly an MEP uh, in, in the Parliament. And there have been other cases, perhaps not as high profile as that, but every time that happens, every time that happens, the EU is damaged and the legitimacy of the EU is damaged. And that is why it is important. So we've been working on this for, for, for many years. Uh, we do it in two ways, uh, individual cases that come to us uh, via uh, complaints. And we've done cases recently involving the European Banking Authority, the European Defence Agency, the European Investment Bank, among others. And then we do more systemic investigations along the lines of the way that the ECA uh, also operates. Uh, so, for example, last year we did a major look at how the Commission handles uh, revolving doors uh, cases, and we looked at 100 separate files of people who had left uh, the Commission. Not not all of them went into the private sector. Some of them went into uh, civil society. Some uh, some of them uh, went into academia and so on. But but a significant number of them obviously went into the private sector as well. And we weren't looking at them individually in. in the sense we weren't inquiring into their, uh, you know, individual choices, but we were looking at how the Commission had dealt with it. And I suppose overall we could say that the Commission was very reluctant to use the powers that it has to really, you know, um, and to really deal with this issue and also to send messages to its, its staff and, and future staff as to what would be expected or not expected of them if they were in such a situation. Uh, the Commission uh, obviously has the power to temporarily prevent somebody from taking up a post, but that was used hardly ever. Uh, instead, there were certain restrictions uh, placed on individuals, but the extent to which they were monitored subsequently, well, it, it wasn't clear. Uh, so I'm going back to the culture again. So if you have in the Commission a culture and a leadership that really sees that this is a problem uh, that's going to cause you know wider problems for the EU generally, it's not just confined to particular individual cases, then things will happen. And if you if you're really not seized of that, if you're really not strongly feeling that this is a problem, then it'll just carry on, and I'll continue doing investigations. The Court of Auditors will continue doing investigations. The media will continue talking about it, and and nothing will. Change. Change. So we made a number of, of recommendations uh, to the uh, to the Commission. One of which was to, you know, try and be a little brave. that uh, in future they should ask uh, the people who are intending to go to a company in, a, in the private sector that that company should have on its website uh, a list of the restrictions that have been placed on an individual. Now, that is quite a big ask, but I'll tell you why, why it's important. Uh, any of you who want to look at the websites of the big consultancy, PR firms, lobbying firms in Brussels will see how prominently they place the, their latest recruits, be it from the Commission or the agencies and so on. Uh, and they're used as branding as advertising and they're used as ways to to get people to come to them and very often some of the more transparent uh, companies will give case histories of we had a client and he was upset about a particular piece of EU re regulation or an EU policy so we worked with so and so in order to bring about change um so it's it's quite clear uh, how valuable uh, they are to to these big companies because the EU is is a, is a regulator it doesn't just regulate for Europe it regulates globally and therefore there's a huge interest in big global companies and making sure that they can uh, affect uh, and amend proposed uh, regulation in a way that suits them and that's that's entirely legitimate that's the way business is done but the concern is that when they 
very deliberately go after people who um, who know the files, who have a, not just a network, but a very, very detailed knowledge of how regulations are put together and then who can advise them to us how best to steer the regulation in the way that they wish. And just finally, why does this matter? Uh, well, let's take the climate crisis at the moment and the fact that the Commission has a very elaborate and very ambitious uh, programme of, of uh, future regulation in order to save the planet. And I'm not being dramatic when I say that. I mean, we studies and reports that have come out over the last few days have shown just how desperate the situation is. But of course, when the Commission puts forward regulation in order to uh, limit uh, the climate crisis damage, equally you have companies whose own business is going to be affected by some of this. So obviously they're going to try and, let's say, water down uh, the, the regulation in a way that, that suits their profits, but which doesn't suit, you know, the amelioration of, of the climate crisis for all of the citizens. And, and that's why these things matter, because by very deliberately choosing to employ uh, people with the insider knowledge, and it's very often, it's not necessarily the top people. I mean, people like Barroso or other commissioners or so on, they're as much a piece of advertising for people because they're not as familiar with the files as some of their more junior employees would be. But when they get people who really know the files, and of course, again, once you go on the websites and you know, there's very detailed accounts of what people had done in uh, their former role, and therefore the big hint is that Look, look at the information we can get for you. Look at how useful we can be uh, through these uh, people. So therefore, there was a suggestion that I made to the Commission that they have the future employer place on their website an acknowledgement of the restrictions uh, that have been placed on this person, I think would be very useful. Now, obviously, there's, I don't think you can legally make them do it, but at least by putting it out there and by being a little bit more imaginative and creative in relation to this and by being real about it and by acknowledging what the game is instead of talking in abstractions, then I think that's the way that, that, that we can begin to make change. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to switch uh, to Vitor Teixeira from Transparency International. Uh, Mr. Teixeira, what is Transparency International's uh, view on the EU's ethical framework and especially uh, the rules on revolving doors for institutions and agencies? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I have to say it's my absolute pleasure to be here today and also to hear that so much of what is being said is uh, in line with our analysis and recommendations for the past decade. Uh, I mean, um, uh, political integrity and ethics is one of the pillars of our work because undue influence, the influence of money in politics is one of the main corruption risks in developing undeveloped uh, economies. And this is true at both national and supranational level. Uh, but going to revolving door specifically, um, I have to say our work has focused mostly on top policy makers of the many institutions, but there are uh, conclusions that, that I think are useful to today's discussion. Uh, so in a report that we did on revolving doors in 2017, uh, we saw that 30% of the MEPs that left politics went to work for organizations on the lobby register. And for the former European commissioners, this was over 50%. And when we analyze the top lobbying uh, organizations out of the, of the give or take 12,000, 13,000 organizations in the register, 20% of the lobbyists working for the top lobbying companies had previously worked in the EU institutions. So the, the point that I want to make here uh, is that there is a, a great appetite on the lobbying world, as it has been said already, for hiring people that in one way or another are involved in EU legislation. Uh, and uh, in a later uh, study, we did the in-depth analysis of the transparency, integrity, and accountability mechanisms of the three main EU institutions just now in 2021. Uh, and I do think that some of the conclusions, some of the broad conclusions that we took from these studies are uh, very similar to the findings that we, that uh, I saw in the annual report. And I have to say thank you very much for your input in this. It's, it's uh, excellent work and it helps so much in our advocacy efforts. Uh, but it, it, And if I can, I will highlight three. So 
uh, the first broad conclusion is that there is no harmonization of the rules for non EU staff and and so it, it each institution each agency does how they see fit and this is problematic because this creates a patchwork an ethical patchwork that is problematic for many in the because many individuals with senior roles that uh, as we just heard a few cases will have little to no post employment obligations um and uh, this this problematic is then further emphasized on on what we believe that there is no actual effective monitoring so uh, uh, just in the annual report right now, we saw that only a small percentage of cases of uh, board member that were the departing board members were actually assessed. And the second point on monitoring is that that for both staff and non-staff, monitoring is largely reactive. So it it depends very much. The mechanisms in place often rely on the self-reporting by the individuals that are leaving. Um, and there, uh, there's no proactive monitoring and control of the people that have left and perhaps have not uh, reported uh, their post-employments. And uh, the third point is on, I would say, on the enforcement and sanctioning. And this is also true for staff and non-staff. Uh, and this, again, goes in line with what what has just been said by by both speakers, in which we find that the even in the cases that uh, that there is an assessment and there is an authorization with restrictions, um, it's almost impossible for the body in question to follow up on those restrictions and ensure compliance. Uh, so when you look at uh, at the general picture and the problems in the different pillars the, uh, when it comes to post-employment and ethics in general, our conclusion is is very clear. In, in our position, the current system of self-regulation, self-monitoring, self-enforcement is non-functional. It doesn't work and we need a new one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Teixeira, for this interesting view. I'd like to switch now to Mr. Fausto Parente from AOVA. Uh, your agency works in the financial sector, so uh, the rules on conflict of interest are, I would even say, more, in, more important for you. Uh, what is your experience with revolving doors and rules? No, you, you, I heard a lot of um, yeah, interesting, um, interesting uh, things, and I, I cannot... I cannot agree more that uh, the risk of conflict of interest is uh, quite uh, a serious one. Has to be, uh, it needs to be tackled appropriately. You ask about the experience of uh, EOPA. I can tell you that it's, um, of course, uh, till now at least, <laughs> cross the finger, we do not have a negative experience concretely uh, in terms of revolving door conflict of interest. This is may maybe because. Um, we took it seriously. There is a, a there are clear rule procedure in place to mini, to minimize such such risk. Um, we performed this uh, analysis before uh, staff uh, join EOPA, and of course we, there are rule in place on the post employment activity that are allowed or not allowed. Everything is based, of course, on the staff regulation, the commission decision on outside activities uh, and our own uh, EOPA internal uh, ethic rule and detailed instruction template uh, and um, procedure on, on which uh, on the basis of which we work. We want to be transparent in our approach since the start. Mm, there are um, post employment activity that are clearly prohibited so that uh, whoever joined knows it since the beginning. Uh, for example, working uh, an insurance undertaking or an institution which is uh, supervised um, directly or indirectly by EOPA or association acting uh, on their behalf. There are activities that are clearly allowed, uh, so employment in, um, in another EU body, in public uh, entities, national authorities, supervisory national authorities or in general public sector academic activity are clearly allowed. And there is a, a, a bit of a third area where, uh, for example, on consultancy, 
uh, or financial institutions which are out of the scope of activity of EOPA, where uh, is not a complete prohibition, but there are um, mitigating measures that uh, needs to be applied in case uh, in case the future uh, uh, employer is uh, is uh, within this scope. Mitigating measures that can vary depending on the level of seniority or the kind of work or kind of responsibility staff member had at EOPA, for example, the, the knowledge, the exposure to confidential information may require more, um, more attentive mitigating measure. Uh, one typical mitigating measure is the prohibition, which is also embedded in the, in the staff regulation, the prohibition to, to make um, any lobbying or advocacy activity vis-a-vis -vis any EOPA staff member for, uh, for a period that, uh, in the case of the senior management, uh, can, last, can last till two years. So for us, uh, the procedure and, uh, and the rule are, are there, are in place. Uh, we want to be transparent since the start. Uh, we are also transparent in terms of information given to the public. Uh, for example, in the, in, on our website, uh, the information of the senior manager that left uh, EOPA in the past uh, are clearly are clearly there this, this described um, for a, for with the, the the date in which they left uh, the, the the employer the the concrete case uh, basically are well known. Uh, if I may, of course, um, all this is not uh, without uh, challenges and and risks. And the risk uh, that we see here is simply basically the 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 the, the attractivity of EOPA as an employer, because we, we do need uh, people uh, with expertise, with skills, uh, also developed uh, in, the, in, the, in the industry to join EOPA, to, to, to work, uh, to change hat, uh, to, to change uh, approach and to become supervisor. This is because they know very well the business, they can bring a added value to, to, to the supervisory activity. So we want to be attractive in general also for people working in the industry or in the consultancy on the market. And here the, 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 the challenge is to, to remain attractive, is to really offer also a possibility to then work uh, return in the in the industry in the industry after a while of course we that's why we want to be transparent we clarify the rule since the start the limitation in terms of time for how long they are prohibited to do some certain activity if they leave a job after the experience so for us uh, the challenges are there we want to remain attractive we need people with different uh, um, skills and experience but it's clearly uh, important to avoid any risk of um, conflict of interest by setting since the start in a transparent way what are the rules, what are then the limits, and people that join EOPA, they should know then what is the possible development of their career in terms of uh, limitation or, or constraints. Uh, till now, we managed, we, we were also able to attract uh, many different uh, kind of um, skills. So. All in all, uh, attention remain high, but I, uh, I can say that till now the experience we had uh, is, a, is a positive one. I stop here, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Parente. Um, turning to the European Banking Authority um, and Mr. François-Louis Michaud, um, your agency was uh, quite famous uh, for revolving doors uh, a few years back when uh, your predecessor left to work for um, a lobby group. Now, what was your experience with this case, uh, implementing the rules at that time and uh, the reputational impact for the agency or the authority? Good morning and thank you very much. I'm very glad to be on this panel discussing those important topics today, especially in the light of indeed what, uh, what happened to the uh, EBA, as you mentioned, a few, a few years ago. We, um, we see that in, in, in Europe, the revolving door issue is probably not as uh, mature as uh, we could see maybe in other jurisdictions, uh, and that might explain why we uh, have been struggling in a number of, of cases. Um, 
I observed the, the topic first from the outside because as I, I was not, of course, at the uh, EBA yet when my uh, predecessor left, uh, but I observed it uh, with a uh, great attention because, of course, I was interested in succeeding him, but also because I, I had seen in, seen, seen in different organizations before how such matters uh, can be handled uh, efficiently. And uh, having worked in, in different parts um, of the world also, uh, I think that, that helped me having a sort of immediate um, um, reaction function to, to that type of, uh, of issues. When I, when I joined the uh, ECB, not the uh, EBA, but the the uh, ECB first, I had seen uh, how, how, how that could be done uh, with the, 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 the gardening leaves, the, uh, the cooling of periods, etc. At the Bank for International Settlements also before, I had seen how very high profile departures had been managed and they had been managed very, uh, I would say, um, aggressively uh, to avoid any, any doubts to, to surface. So I think that inspired me a lot when I, when I joined the uh, EBA. And uh, I, I tried to, to strengthen the, the setup in, in, in different ways, and I'll come to that in a, in a second. But first, I'd like to make three remarks on how those things should preferably be handled. The first one is that perception is as important as reality in such cases. Reputation is something which is extremely fragile. It can be damaged for a very long time. It's very difficult to, to get it back when, once it's been, it's been damaged. So perception needs to be considered uh, as much as uh, what's the reality of the of the situation i think that that's the first takeaway i would i would flag this morning um the the organization should be uh, even more worried about what how the situation could be uh, perceived how it could be interpreted etc and, and sometimes they lose sight of that because they are so much into the details and they know the case and they know the persons and, and they think, okay, I mean, we, we know that it's not so bad and that we, we are managing, et cetera, et cetera. And they tend to underestimate the, um, the, 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 the perception of the, of the problem outside. So I think this is the first thing one needs to be, to get very serious about perception. The second takeaway I, I have from, from those different cases I've seen, uh, at Libya and elsewhere is that the reaction function is very important. And, and the reaction here needs to be fast and strong. It's much better to overshoot first and, and then adjust later on than the other way around. It, it's, it's very difficult if you don't start it right to, to get it back uh, right. Uh, it, it's too late. It's just too late. So I think it's much better to, and that comes into cutting off people from key systems, uh, making it clear uh, that they don't, uh, they are not in a position to attend important discussions anymore. And, and that also needs to be communicated internally and externally so that there is no doubt and that people know how to behave vis-a-vis -vis those departing people. So I think that that has a lot to do about moving fast and moving strong. And then the, the third uh, takeaway I have uh, is that our organizations, uh, and, and most of them or many of them are relatively young. EBA was not even 10 years when, when those uh, developments uh, happened. Our organizations need to be well prepared in advance. And that one shouldn't wait for, for those cases to, to happen, to, 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 to invent on the fly uh, what, what should be the, the reaction. There should be clarity in-house on how such things would be handled uh, well in advance. Staff need, need, need to, be, to be clear about that from recruitment day. That should be clear. That should be understood. And I think that's why also probably we have seen a little bit of a hesitation uh, at times uh, across our organizations uh, because they are so young and, and they, they, they were simply not prepared when they were first faced uh, with such developments. Whereas more uh, mature organizations, which had a longer history, uh, were a little bit more uh, prepared. So I think we need also to constantly learn from the most advanced organizations, try to borrow the, the best practices from them, and accept that to some extent, it's a little bit of a uh, goalpost moving there. I mean, we, we need the, 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 the perception, the expectations, what's acceptable or not, is not uh, set in stone. It will evolve over time. We need to be cognizant of that. And we need to adjust our setups also in the light of what is the opinion's expectation vis-a-vis -vis our organizations. We need to be, of course, integer. We, we integrity ethics. Uh, are so important for us because we set rules for 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 yeah, at EBA, for instance, for for banks and and for supervisors. So, of course, our own integrity, our own ethics uh, needs to be uh, beyond any any doubt. 
maybe I'll, I'll leave it at those three takeaways for the time being, and uh, and I'm happy to come back on the uh, measures we've taken internally uh, if that's if that's okay at a later stage. Th thank you, Mr. Michel, for, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to go back to Emily O'Reilly. Uh, you investigated uh, the EBA case and similar ones. Um, can you tell us about your conclusions and if something has uh, changed based on them? Well, in, in relation to the European Banking Authority, yes, in that, that case, the executive uh, director of the authority had gone to one of the biggest financial lobbying uh, firms in, in, in Europe. Um, and we said if there was ever a case that you should have prevented from happening or somebody that they should have stopped from taking up that position, that's the one uh, that, that you should have done. Um, and, and I think just the backdrop to this is the EBA was created in 2011 out of the ashes of the financial crisis, which damaged and destroyed so many people's lives all over the world, including okay. in, in Europe. And part of the rationale for the creation of, of the EBA was to restore not just good financial regulation, but also public trust in financial regulation. So, you know, that was very much part of a, a rebuilding of public confidence in, in the EU's capacity to, to regulate financial markets, banks and so on. So you can see how damaging it was uh, for the, the head of that agency at the time to, to move into you know, a firm whose uh, main goal, obviously aim, uh, was to try and influence the making of, of those regulations. But could I just say that I want to commend um, the EBA for the way in which it, it handled um, our, our investigation, it responded to our investigation. Um, and, and I think just from what Monsieur Michaud has, has said and demonstrated is what I was talking about earlier, that if you have a leadership that really understands this issue, and finds it problematic and then seeks ways to, to deal with it, then, then that's really all you need. Everything flows from the top. Um, and so I will leave Mr. Michaud to, to talk about what, what they did put in place. But for us, what was a very concrete example of their essential um, cultural understanding of why this was problematic was when the same individual attempted to uh, go to another uh, private sector uh, job. He was forbidden uh, to do so. So this really wasn't just words. Uh, the EBA were acting as well. And, and I know it's very, I appreciate how difficult it is to, to manage these issues because you're talking about, about human beings, you're talking about interpersonal relationships, you have all sorts of issues that are, that are coming into it. And that is why, uh, as Mr. Michaud has said, it's very important to, to, to prepare for this and to put in place systems where people who come in to organizations like the EBO know what the game is, even when they, when, when they try to go, but also that people are treated fairly and humanely. And I also understand, of course, that a lot of people don't have the privilege of having a, a job for life within the EU. Some of them are on short contracts. Um, and, and, you know, that has to be accommodated as well. You know, people just can't be thrown out in the street with, with nothing to do. Though I will insist that, that lobbying is not the only thing that, that people can do. Presumably they came into <coughs> organizations of the prestige of the EBA because they were very clever and very skilled in lots of things. So presumably it's, it's not the only thing that they, they can do uh, when they leave. But again, I just want to say, and it's not just because Mr. Michaud is here listening to me, but um, uh, I, I think they have, in a very concrete way, showed that that they um, they, they, they got what we were saying and they, and they understood at a DNA level why it was important. Thank you. Thank you, Emily O'Reilly. I just go back to Francois Louis Michaud. Um, uh, the auditors in, in the annual report noted that uh, there are only. Uh, three agencies where there are uh, clear internal rules on revolving doors for board members and also uh, procedures for monitoring compliance. So what, what has changed, uh, changed since you started uh, as, ex as uh, executive director? Yeah, so <clears throat> th thanks a lot. So, so first of all, I'd say that um, first, I mean, I, I mean the, the situation was uh, not entirely bad uh, by far. You know, when, when, I, when I joined, I found something that was already on, on a very good uh, track. So we, it was uh, just a little bit about uh, strengthening that and embedding it further and, and making sure that we live by our standards. And so, but that was clearly one of my of my top priorities uh, when I when I joined for the for the reasons explained uh, by Mrs. O'Reilly before, that uh, the EBA couldn't simply uh, you know, continue with such a uh, damaging uh, reputation. So we essentially, I think the 
first I did an assessment of the situation. I worked a little bit with the team. I consulted around uh, and tried to, to refer to the, the standards we, we, we could uh, have at, at other organizations, as I, as I mentioned before. But um, very quickly, uh, we, we moved in January 2021. Uh, I joined in September 2020. And in, in January 2021, we introduced a much stronger setup on the whole that was predicated on three main pillars. One is processes, the second is uh, the structure, and, and the third is culture. So on the, just in a very, uh, in, in a few words, and I think those things were mentioned before uh, by, by previous speakers as well, uh, including Fausto, but on, on processes, uh, we, we need two main elements. We, we need uh, policy, uh, of course, and we have, and we beefed up our policy on post-employment restrictions and, and prohibitions. Uh, we have clear rules. Uh, they are proportionate. They, they, they depend on the type of responsibilities you have in the in the organization. And that should be, of course, a one size fits all. That that should be adequate to to what the situation. And that should be known. So that's available on our website. People know from uh, the beginning uh, what uh, they will be asked about uh, their post employment restrictions and so on and so forth. Second uh, element regarding processes, second key element, we uh, strengthened our policy to restrict access to confidential confidential information for, for staff leaving the organization. And, and that means also that you need to have the right systems in place, uh, something that allows you very easily to cut people off uh, from the whole range of system, remove them from the distribution list and so on and so forth. So very practical things, uh, but that needs to be uh, prepared and, uh, and managed. And of course, we, we also need to look at what's the situation beyond the uh, organization uh, staff itself. Uh, and, and that includes, as was mentioned before, also looking into um, the, the, the board members potentially, because they are part of our governance. So we cannot completely and simply ignore them. Uh, we all file uh, our uh, uh, details uh, when we uh, join boards and when we join other organizations that that's good but we shouldn't leave it at that we should uh, of, of course continuously uh, check on 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 how the situation evolves during the uh, the, the time of the employment or, or of the appointment but also afterwards so we we've done those three things regarding processes Processes are good, but you also need a structure to uh, support them. Uh, so the, the second uh, key decision I took was to uh, beef up the legal and compliance team uh, with, uh, to give it more seniority. So our ethics officer got more seniority. He reports directly to me. He also can rely on a um, stronger team uh, with more people and more expertise. So I think that's also pretty important. You need to invest a few resources on, on those topics. Otherwise, it will it will not happen as simply as that. I mean, it's a cost uh, for our small structures. We should accept that it's a it's a cost that's worth uh, that's worth paying because the uh, as we said before, the, the damages are, are so important potentially. So we we've put in place a uh, a, a stronger structure to to support this this function. And this structure itself allows to uh, do the ex-ante assessment, but also the ongoing monitoring of the, of, of the rules. So we, we enforce, we, we, we do enforce and, and we go after, after people to get the, the right information. And we check also on, on post-employment with the, uh, the, the organizations uh, which have recruited our, our people and so forth and uh, etc. So third element, which is uh, absolutely essential is culture. Uh, you can have uh, excellent processes. We can have a fantastic structure, but if the culture is simply not there, uh, this will uh, this will still not work. So culture is is very important, and that's probably, as Mrs. O'Reilly was also saying, the the difficult part in itself because it's a constant fight. I mean, we need, of course, to to keep it up, and and we need to make sure that the staff understands, and, and the staff have the the right behavior, the right reaction. For instance, a key element for us is that by the moment people start having interviews. Uh, outside the organization for a job, they should be in touch with our ethics department. And, and again, I, we understand that people might be shy, might not be able to really fully willing to talk to their managers about that, but we have the ethics unit for that and, and they should talk, they should say and that what they are talking about for a possible future job position, because that it can have an impact on, on, on what we allow them to do internally. So we've been repeatedly, relentlessly communicating on that. Uh, Tone clearly comes from the top. We 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 need to uh, invest ourselves uh, sufficient time, um, air time. We need to uh, walk the talk on, on that. 
And, but people so, should also do their animal trainings. Uh, they need to file their information and we need to go after them uh, if, if that's not the case. So we have con compulsory training, for instance. We have, we have awareness, uh, awareness sessions and, and we try to speak of it ourselves, uh, the, the senior management repeatedly so that people understand that we're not joking about. I think that that's the key uh, mix, probably processes, structure and, and culture. But again, it's never a given. It's never uh, entirely won, and, and vigilance is probably the, the key. The key word. I would also subscribe to uh, what Mrs. O'Reilly was saying before, and also what what Fausto was saying on the fact that we need to attract talent, uh, and and for the the, the the jobs which have a, a short term contract in particular, we need to be careful not to narrow down too much the options. And if the rules are so stringent, so strict that this might discourage talents to apply for certain of our jobs, then we have a problem. And I think that that's why we need to work also on cooling off issues, on gardening leave schemes, and see whether the, the, the network of the agencies, for instance, or the European institutions as a whole, couldn't be leveraged on that context. And just so that people who are on the short-term contract at a very senior level uh, could be used for doing something useful for the community before they leave still being paid uh, for that time so that, that they wouldn't be paid for, for nothing, like in certain gardening leaves we see in other organizations, but they would still do something for the European institutions, would be useful, and that would, of course, make the information they have much less relevant when they join their next organization. So I think we, we probably need to think creatively on, on those topics and see whether we cannot facilitate uh, this transition for, for the people who do not have, do not have the option of, uh, of going uh, to a uh, public organization after they, they have held responsibilities at, a, at, a, at an agency. And I, I fully agree, of course, that, that uh, lobbying is not, uh, is not probably the best uh, choice or, or the, shouldn't be uh, high on, on the list of possible jobs afterwards for any of our uh, senior colleagues. Um, I, I think we don't jo join the, the organizations um, I mean, with that in mind uh, most of the time, and I think that there are many opportunities, but still, we need to make sure that there are sufficient opportunities afterwards and that it's not only about retiring, hiring people who might retire afterwards. Uh, there, 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 there is a need for uh, careers to continue and for people to be able to support their families. Well, th thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll stop uh, at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Michaud, for, for this overview of what the ABA has done recently to, to tackle and address the, the issue of revolving doors. Um, I, I would like, we have about 10 to 15 minutes left in this um, in this session. I would like perhaps to get back to uh, my guest here in the studio, uh, Mikhail Skoslov. Uh, you uh, recommended some major changes um, to the rules for EU agencies uh, and uh, previously also for EU institutions in a special report on performance audit for which you were the reporting member. Now, where are the main gaps and which improvements are needed? And also, can the agencies learn from the EU institutions? Yes, um, thank you, Fabrice. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think I, I, on on this, I would like to start where uh, one of the one of the previous speakers uh, finished. One size doesn't fit all. I think someone said, um, and also I think here uh, this uh, you know EU EU motto is is very valid, uh, united in diversity. Um, the the situation is is as follows that that we have some uh, horizontal, high level, um, aspirational level values, I, I would say, uh, that stem from the, from the EU treaties uh, themselves that should guide the, code, you know, the conduct of members and staff of the EU institutions. Um, and I'm also aware of the ongoing debate about uh, the need for some uh, you know, high level ethical framework for all the institutions you know, across the board and maybe, maybe even more a uh, separate institution that would uh, see, you know, see to these cases and see uh, to, uh, you know, to achieve the situation that, uh, you know, all in all, uh, the the level of uh, ethical frameworks um, is um, is being improved. But obviously, and what I understood from the discussion that that one size doesn't fit all. Uh, in this, I mean, first of all, the institutions themselves are very different. Even if we talk about the institutions, I mean, the, the 
the Commission, uh, the Parliament, even, even the Court of Auditors, they are different with different uh, risk profiles. Uh, um, the agencies even more so. So this actually actually warrants um, this actually warrants maybe uh, specific uh, specific approaches uh, to uh, to particular um, situations. Um, and we know there are specific legal provisions in, for example, in various director generals of the Commission. This, and some of them are very rigorous. We also heard now of very rigorous, uh, rigorous provisions in some of uh, of the agencies. Um, and this, I think, should depend on uh, the risk profile. And I think one of the uh, one of the good examples here is proximity to business in terms of executive power uh, of the agency to affect uh, the businesses. And I think in, in many cases, agencies are very close to business. This is normal. This is kind of by definition, that's what they expected to do. In, in other cases, link, uh, this link is not so direct. Um, in the Commission's DGs, as I mentioned, some of them are very close to business. For example, DG competition that we looked at very carefully as part of uh, the audit that uh, Fabrice referred to. And there we found, for example, a uh, very strong integrity framework on top of uh, minimum requirements that stands for treaty. And I think this is for a very good reason. Uh, therefore, I think one of the takeaways for me would be that, that this, you know, across the board approach should work at a certain level, but then um, there should be someone who uh, does a careful risk assessment for each uh, institution, each director general maybe, and even obviously uh, 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 each of, of the agencies. And we certainly see uh, from our report that was published just today, I think, uh, uh, there, is, um, there is room for improvement. Um, for example, we found that uh, only only nine agencies uh, had introduced their own internal rules uh, to deal with the lack of provisions in EU legislation governing the activities of members of agencies' boards. I think my colleague Rimantas mentioned uh, this. And in general, what we found is uh, that the agencies are quite reluctant to go beyond the minimum legal frameworks when handling potentially revolving those situations. In some cases, maybe justified. But maybe in some other cases, uh, the agencies themselves uh, don't do enough uh, you know, to move in the right direction. And as a result, uh, only a small fraction of potential revolving door cases in agencies' board members are subject to, to any assessment. And obviously, there are, uh, there are certain risks uh, stemming, uh, stemming from that. Uh, Regarding the the post employment, uh, you know, the post employment activities in in the institutions, uh, we found that in many of them, in majority of them, they are quite well developed. The problem is obviously, as some colleagues mentioned, how to implement them because uh, here we face the issue of cost of control, you know, you know cost of controls, uh, and it is an important consideration, as I think uh, a colleague from the European Banking Authority mentioned. It is an important consideration, so it has to be uh, taken uh, uh, in, into account. Uh, some colleagues also mentioned, mentioned reliance on the self-declaration. Uh, self-declaration obviously can't stand uh, the test alone. It has to uh, go together, as uh, the Ombudsman said, uh, together with uh, very careful attention to the ethical frameworks, integrity frameworks in the EU institutions, because when we did audit, some of our auditees told us, well, you know, but we, we, uh, we can't invest so much, and if there is anything serious, uh, we, will, we will hear from outside, from external uh, stakeholders uh, like, uh, you, you know, whistleblowers, media, and so on. Well, for me, for me, it is a bit uh, too late, and uh, it, 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 it begs the question uh, uh, that, of course, these players are a very important part of these checks and balances systems, uh, but the internal lines of defense, I think, should be able to prevent uh, the majority of cases in, uh, in the first place. There are obviously some other differences between uh, uh, institutions and, and agencies, and you can find them in the report, and some of them are more important than others. For example, we found that even definitions of outside activities and gifts among various institutions are not the same. And this begs the question, why? Why aren't they, aren't they the same? Because uh, the profiles of uh, staff, for example, that we looked at, they are more or less, more or less similar. So to sum up, I know we, we, we are running a bit short of time. Uh, to sum up, I think from the Court of Auditors, we, we do expect the institutions and, uh, and the agencies 
to manage these risks effectively uh, and to promote ethical culture and to raise awareness. Uh, we also, at the Court of Auditors, we are doing this, uh, this ourselves. We are, uh, I mean, our rules are constantly under review, uh, not least based also on the, on the, uh, on the audit that uh, we did on other institutions, and we were ourselves subject to a very rigorous peer review. But I think the main takeaway from me is that um, prevention is uh, better, it's cheaper, it's easier than correction. Because if things are prevented, they don't hit uh, the media. When they hit the media, to be honest, I haven't heard of any follow-up in terms of if and how situation changed vis-a-vis -vis certain, uh, certain individuals who violated apparently the rules. There is no follow-up. We don't know whether these cases are being corrected. And I think it's better, therefore, to uh, um, move into preventive action and to build these internal, uh, internal uh, lines of defense. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Koslos. Um, I would like to get back one moment to Fausto Parente, and, and quickly, if you don't mind, because we're running out of time. Um, but the question actually applies to all the agencies. I mean, how should the rules for conflict of interest uh, and revolving doors develop uh, to ensure high-level ethics but keep specialized agencies uh, attractive employers? Everybody mentioned the difficulty in uh, finding uh, and attracting staff. Um, how do you see that the rules would need to, to evolve? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I, I concur with uh, what uh, Francois-Louis said. And actually, even though we did not have the direct uh, negative um, experience, we, we leverage actually on the lessons learned uh, looking uh, at uh, uh, a bit outside the job. So we supported fully all the efforts done and many of the things that were mentioned by Francois-Louis are also in place uh, at the job. So it, it's really an important point, this of the, the balance to be, to be found between uh, remaining attractive uh, and still uh, dealing seriously, rigorously with the conflict of interest risk. One point may be that uh, was not yet mentioned, and I think it's important to have in mind, is that the cost of control can be faced, needs to be faced. The, the self-declaration is an important part of the control system, but it's not enough. So we need to do more. Fine. There is one point anyway, that not at the top level, because at the top level, myself, the chair, there are provisions in place and we don't, uh, we do not have such a, a problem, if I can say so. But if you go down in the hierarchy, middle management level, staff member, if they decide to resign from, from a Yopa, from a, a European agency, there is no indemnity. There is no cooling off period. This is a bit, uh, in my view, something that we need to tackle because other organizations offer, depending on the level of the seniority, depending on the different cases, but offer such indemnity. And if uh, the system can be complemented with something like this, I think that this can allow, let's say, can, can tackle better the risk that the, the staff member, as Francois-Louis said, um, when they just start with the first interview, <laughs> for 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 another employer maybe uh, they immediately are encouraged let's say to 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 disclose the 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 event this is a, in my view is a is a, a way to complement the current effort we are doing in a manner which is simply reasonable in my way because if you think about a, a resignation, a people stuff uh, resignating from EOPA and for a while it, they can't work in some areas, then we need to provide an indemnity for this period. Can be three months, six months, whatever, depending on the seniority. But I think a serious discussion around it uh, should start one day. I stop here. Okay, th thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very, very quickly now, because we, we have not much time left, I I'd like to turn to uh, Victor Teixeira and look at the perception um, of, of the citizens. Do, do you, how do you see that the 
citizens perceive this, if they are aware of this, and, and what is Transparency International's uh, take on the uh, rules uh, on uh, revolving doors in agencies? Thank you. Uh, I mean, very quickly. Uh, so the last Eurobarometer on corruption, which just happened this year, uh, more than three quarters of the people said that they believe the two close links between uh, businesses and policy or politics lead to corruption. And as it was said in some agencies, the links are rather close. Uh, I think it's uh, obvious from what was said today that the less an, uh, a system, uh, the less effective a system is, the more and more scandals are bound to happen. And I think this will only confirm what people already believe. And with every scandal, trust is eroded. And again, on the last, uh, on the standard Eurobarometer, just this summer, uh, let's not beat around the bush. Less than half of the citizens trust or uh, the the EU, the European institutions, and the European bodies. So, if we extrapolate to a population, we're talking about uh, give or take 250 million people that do not believe in European institutions. And this has serious consequences for democracies, as it was mentioned uh, before. And often people, and I do know, and we applaud the best examples, but as TI, as a civil society organization, we take this as a systemic approach. And uh, often people tell us some pillars work. But this is the same as saying, well, I'll put my foot into a, a, and travel by airplane on, in an airplane in which half of the, of the pieces are functional. I don't think anyone would actually do that. Uh, and I would say that our asks are quite clear. So number one, the rules must be in place for all individuals. No one should be falling outside ethical obligations. And those rules should be made clear for the new staff. So when they start, it should be known to them what is expected of them. Uh, second, uh, and I will shamelessly steal from Ms. O'Reilly's, uh, all flows from the top. Uh, and one of the political priorities of the current commission when they, uh, when they started was the creation of a new Essex body. But after three years, we're still waiting. Now, if the commission, uh, if the promise is kept, uh, our concern is that such a body would have no teeth and uh, uh, the scope uh, of its res responsibilities would be too, too small. So we're on the wait and see, but where there is a will, there is a way. Uh, and if there is such a body, uh, it, it needs to address so many things that were said today. It will need to have sufficient resources and mandate to to monitor, to take decisions, and to uh, to control for compliance and sanction if necessary. Um, and up until this happens, the the scandals are not a matter of uh, of if; it's a matter of when. Uh, and uh, if my last point is addressing some of the things that were said by other uh, by the other speakers. Allow me to give you the example of Canada, because we're talking about, it's true that rules need to be in place, but there's the fear that uh, they will not be able to attract talent. In Canada, uh, senior, former senior officials are, have a five-year lobby ban, so they cannot conduct any lobbying for five years. And after those five years, they have a lifelong ban to switch sides. So from taking improper advantage of a previously held public office and improperly using that information to, for the benefit of, an empl of the new employer. So I would say with a five year long ban overall and uh, a, life, a lifelong prohibition from switching sides, if we look at the EU and the EU agencies and EU institutions, we're quite far from this, from this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Teixeira, on the views for, for int uh, Transparency International. Uh, last point, last question, perhaps, back to Emily O'Reilly. Um, uh, culture at the top, credibility, uh, reputational risks, um, uh, five years and lifelong ban. Um, how do you see uh, the future rules uh, on revolving doors? 
Well, I think it's it's clear from what we've heard today that they they need to be um, they need to be strengthened. And uh, as 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 Vitor just said, you know, if the EU really wants to do something, it'll do it. We've seen over the last number of years between the various crises, whether the financial crisis or uh, or COVID or now Ukraine, when the EU wants to get its act together, it can move incredibly swiftly. And it can also delay if it really doesn't want to do something. So that, that that's very important. But I, I, I remember a few years ago, there was a very famous uh, Washington lobbyist called Jack Abramoff, uh, who was eventually jailed for some of his exploits. But he wrote a book with the zeal of the convert. And he said, um, he described the revolving door as the single biggest source of corruption within Washington. Now, I think we're still quite a long way from that. But all of these things begin with baby steps. And uh, if you don't um, make changes or if you don't recognize at a very early stage that something's going wrong, then, you know, bad things happen. So obviously some of the issues that have been raised here about about attracting staff and being fair to contract agents and so on, and whether you need to have a one size fits all or whether you need to have a, a sort of a, a a different system, they're all very important and they all need to be discussed. I think I think obviously not one size doesn't fit all, but I think if you begin at least with a principles based approach and that there is agreement around the principles that everything will flow from that. But just to repeat, if the EU does not want to have this potential source of corruption you know, uh, in its midst or developing o over time, then it can, it can act to to stop it, and and that takes leadership. And uh, we've seen in, in certain agencies when they when they when they get it, then those sort of scandals do not emerge, or at least they they are mitigated. Uh, and again, uh, it's very important that the EU administration understands why this is a problem and and moves to fix it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily O'Reilly. Um, this brings us to the end of, of this panel discussion. Um, I think we, we all speakers agree that uh, new rules or improved rules still need to be addressed. Uh, there needs to be a harmonization. There needs to be tone and culture at the top. Many, many items, uh, and there is a consensus that we need some improvement still to guarantee uh, independence uh, of key staff. I would like to thank all the panelists for, for contributing uh, to this discussion. Um, and we will now um, move to the second panel discussion of our conference uh, in a few moments. Welcome back, everyone, to the second panel discussion. Uh, in today's conference, we will address the issue of financial regulation and public procurement with the question, are the rules a fit for EU agencies of different sizes? Uh, we will have an overview of the rules, financial regulation, procurement. Um, we will look at the challenges for the EU agencies uh, and also the new financial uh, regulation proposal that's on the table. If you want to read more about it, at least in the findings of the European Court of Auditors Annual Report on the agencies, you can find them on page 39 for those of you who already downloaded uh, the annual report. Uh, joining us live in uh, this uh, panel uh, discussion are uh, Ms. Maria Rosa Aldea Busquets, Deputy Director General of the European Commission for DG Budget, uh, Ms. Joanna Metaxopoulou, the uh, Director of the Audit Chamber responsible for the audit of the agencies, Mr. Krum Garkov, the Executive Director of the European Union Agency for the Operation Management of Large-Scale IT Systems, known as EU LISA. And last but not least, Mr. Xavier Matteo de Cortada, Director ad Interim of, at the European Training Foundation. I would like to ask the first question to my guest in the studio, uh, Ioana Metaxopoulou. We heard earlier um, that procurement remains the biggest um, source of error the auditors found, find every year. Um, I think many citizens are basically asking themselves, are these rules complex rules and the administrative burden, are they all really necessary? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, my first exposure to public procurement uh, was uh, 20 years ago when I first uh, joined the EU institutions. And I think uh, that if you had asked me the same question back then, probably my answer would have been the same as today. Uh, public procurement is indeed uh, sometimes complex and burdensome, but in my opinion, it is uh, absolutely essential. EU public procurement uh, plays an important uh, role in the EU single market, uh, and it is governed by rules uh, that tend to remove uh, barriers uh, to competition and open up uh, markets. Uh, 
I think uh, that you will agree with me that uh, it, uh, public procurement is a major driver for uh, uh, growth, uh, economic growth, for job creation and innovation. And as a small institution in terms both of uh, budget and size, the European Court of Auditors uh, also follows uh, the public procurement rules uh, and we face uh, similar challenges to those of the agencies uh, when it comes to the complexity of the rules uh, uh, when purchasing uh, goods and services. However, we should not forget uh, that the objective of uh, public procurement rules is to ensure fair competition between the tenderers across the EU and to procure goods and services uh, at the best price while respecting the key principles uh, of openness, uh, equal treatment and transparency. Uh, in other words, uh, public procurement creates uh, a level playing field uh, for businesses uh, across the EU to uh, compete on contracts on the same grounds uh, uh, within the internal market. Uh, no one, you would agree with me, should be disadvantaged uh, because of barriers, language barriers or national legislation uh, or uh, unduly specific conditions. So the EU procurement rules uh, are necessary, in my opinion, to ensure that these key principles that I've mentioned earlier, that is openness, equal treatment and transparency, are implemented uh, fairly and with uh, legal clarity across uh, the EU. And I think that uh, in the current economic environment, uh, and um, sound procurement uh, rules are all the more important in order to obtain uh, best value from the scarce financial resources. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, we as EU bodies, uh, we should uh, lead by example and follow these rules. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn to the European Commission. Uh, Maria Rosa Aldea Busquets from DG Budge. At the Commission, your Director General is responsible uh, for procurement rules and financial regulation. What are the, the current rules and, and how do you support the EU agency's administration uh, in these matters? Okay, hello. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's a pertinent question. It's a question that is uh, very well linked to the first question to Joanna. And I would like to say that I totally agree uh, with what Joanna has said, no? that it's sometimes the uh, public procurement rules could be seen complicated, but are essential. And everybody has to apply these uh, rules. And we, uh, all the institutions and agencies, we need to lead by example. But the, what is the legal framework? Because that I think it's important to know what is the legal fr framework in place. The first one, there are three levels. The first level is the financial regulation. The financial regulation is the regulation that applies to the uh, general budget of the union. Based on this financial regulation, we have the framework financial regulation for the agencies. Based on this framework, each agencies adopt the financial rules of each agencies. That means that the rules of the agencies are the same rules that we have in the Commission and in the other institution. It's a cascade of rules. The rules of the agencies are less than the rules of the Commission because the activity is a little, it's the scope of the activity is smaller than the scope of the activity of the Commission. But I think that is important. The agencies apply the same rules for procurement than the Commission. And what are the roles of procurements that are included in the financial regulation? In the financial regulation, we have transposed the, the rules of the procurement directive, uh, which is applicable to all public contracting authorities in the member state. That means that all institutions, all agencies, all joint undertakings are applying the same procurement rules that member states public contracting authorities. And that I think it's, uh, it's, it's important to take it into account. Uh, these principles, there are many principles in this directive that has been transposed to the, to the financial regulation and we can find the, the principles or rules of accountability, competition, consistency, effectiveness, equal treatment, integrity, transparency, responsive. There are principles that are key to ensure an open competition in every uh, single procurement that we want to launch inside the European Union or outside the European Union. The framework financial regulation on the basis of what it, the centralized agencies adopt its uh, financial regulation uh, is based on a, on a set of rules and could 
take into account some de uh, derogations. If the agencies would like to introduce some derogations, the agencies has to request to the European Commission, has to motivate the reasons why they would like to introduce some derogations. This is very well analyzed inside the, the Commission by the DG budget, by the Central Financial Service, and then the derogation is accepted or not. In the past, we have accepted some delegations. I would like to say two examples. For example, allowing Frontex to conduct joint procurement procedure for the acquisition of operational equipment with any member states, or in Eurojust, joint procurement with international organizations. But there are other delegations that we have given. What is the, the role of the Commission supporting decentralization? Is that was your second question. And I think I would like to say that thanks that all this harmonization of the rules for procurement, the Commission can give a strong support to the agencies. And the Commission is given to the agencies the same support that uh, um, that this budget is given to other uh, DGs because it's each the director general in the commission, each department that are uh, doing procurement procedure. It's not that we have a centralized procurement procedure inside the, the commission. Uh, and this support is of different measures. We have, for example, developed an harmonized set of procurement rules, templates, and guidance. All of that is available not only inside the Commission, but also uh, to the agencies. We, are, we have prepared procurement trainings, also workshops. All the staff of the, of the agencies can apply and can participate in these procurement trainings and workshops. We have created a network of agencies uh, for, uh, for procurement officers where it's possible to discuss all the questions, issues that the agencies have. The agencies can, uh, can send uh, specific questions to DigiBudget and DigiBudget is answering. And we are preparing uh, a, a corporate procurement a solution from the beginning until the financial part that will be everything integrated that we are also proposing to the, all these packages to the agencies. And there are some agencies that already are using this e-procurement for the pre award As you, uh, as you uh, can see, there are many things that we can support the agencies. But one thing that is important is that when there are real issues, it's the best thing to do is to have a very constructive and discussion with the, the specialists in DG budget, in the specialists in the Commission, but that are in uh, DG budget. Thank you, Ms. and Lea Busquets, uh, for this uh, introduction on the uh, European Commission's role. Um, I'd like to turn to EU Lisa and Krum Garkov here. You, your agency builds uh, and operates large-scale computer systems, uh, which is probably a very complex task. Um, at the recent event at the European Parliament, uh, you said that your agency saves taxpayers money. How do you do that and, and which role do procurement rules play in that? Yeah. Uh, indeed, first of all, uh, good uh, afternoon or morning to everyone who joined this uh, panel. The topic is very relevant, and before I speak about the efficiencies that agency by agency introduced through the years, I just want to make a few remarks uh, to follow up interventions of the previous speakers. Now, first of all, I cannot agree more that we need procurement rules, and those procurement rules should be unified. We need to have a common set of instruments when we speak about public procurement. And the question is not of uh, having different rules for different agencies or entities, but the degree of flexibility of those uh, rules. What I mean? Now, when we speak about the area of responsibilities of my agency, we are dealing with digital, we are dealing, dealing with, with technologies. And now, from practical point of view, the, the, the focus is more and more shifted to, rather than how to buy, to what to buy. So this is about efficiency, but at the same time, what we have now uh, as procurement rules is, uh, to say at least, uh, quite inflexible. And there is a growing gap between what we need to do and what we are asked to do. And the fact that the procurement rules today are fixed, are focused mostly on compliance rather than on efficiency. So this is, I think, the biggest challenge that uh, we face uh, today in EULISA when we speak about public procurements. Now, Speaking about efficiency, uh, of course, there are many 
many ways to introduce uh, that and they're not always straightforward again due to the limitations of the present uh, procurement rules but i'll give you two examples that are quite uh, uh, self-explanatory um, with the implementation of the previous recast of the uh, re uh, regulation for Eurodac, and Eurodac is a platform that is used by the member states to practically implement the European Common Asylum System, agency organized for most of the member states uh, centralized procurement, which at the end, based on our assessment, saved about 40% of the total cost that that uh, implementation would uh, uh, cost if member states have done that in the old classic way unilaterally. Another example is the implementation of the entry exit uh, system uh, today. Part of part of the system, which is quite complex and uh, it entails very complex technical infrastructure, was also procured uh, centrally, and uh, uh, that saved uh, again from our point of view a huge amount of public money, 30 million plus, without getting into details. And last but not least. Uh, the last example, which comes to demonstrate what I said uh, before, the inflexibility of the present procurement rules and their focus on compliance rather than on efficiency. Uh, I think it's not a secret that uh, we've been criticized by the Court of Auditors last year for a particular tender procedure where agency made the decision uh, to use different software solution than the one what, what, which was named into the offer of a particular tender but in fact that choice of the agency saved more than 20 million euros of the european taxpayers over five million uh, uh, five five years period so all those examples come to show that yes procurement rules can be one of the drivers of efficiency but they need to evolve and match the reality on the market generally speaking today Thank you, Mr. Garkov. Uh, on, on precisely the flexibility of, of rules, um, we, we look at here now the ETF, and uh, Mr. De Cortada, you uh, represent a smaller agency with around 130 staff. Uh, in your experience, um, how, this, uh, how do the uh, procurement rule, um, how, how are they applicable uh, or suitable for a smaller sized uh, agency? Thank you. Um, yes, I think in, in from our point of view, the 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 procurement rules are suitable for for an agency of our size. Uh, but I think that there are more can can be done in order to to increase the the efficiency and and the simplification, which I think it's something that we live uh, today. There are good examples like that. I think that now the the possibility of uh, of using. Um, um, it's just like the, the qualification uh, uh, for and the experience uh, when in the recruitment processes or or the the what was mentioned before by uh, by Hans uh, Brunick on um, on the, the possibility of using agencies more as a as a consultants or as uh, advisors of the commission also through um, some projects that the commission otherwise is going to the market uh, see there are things like that uh, like uh, using the pillar assessment and the and the section on the, for the pillar assessment i think this is our, i think uh, good opportunities uh, um, i think they among the things that uh, need to be done uh, still to to do is uh, all the possibilities of uh, using synergies with uh, other agencies or with the commission services in order to um, reduce some of the tendering procedures and so on or having a common uh, access to uh, access to common contracts or or um, join partnerships uh, between agencies i think this is a, is a very promising uh, thing and um, and then the, there is a, another area that I would like to say is that the, um, I think the we we need to 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 have the possibility of of assessing when and how uh, procurement is the only option or the best option. I, I, there are 
things that uh, are in the financial regulation for for other uh, bodies and, and institutions like uh, grants for example which in some cases uh, could be uh, suitable for some situations that we are dealing or other types of uh, partnership between agencies and and uh, partnerships with international organizations which uh, should uh, use other tools rather than strictly the, the procurement use. I, I mean, the, all the financial regulations think that uh, we are buying services and we are buying goods. And sometimes the use of the, of the, of the budget can be for other things, of course, uh, within the, the, the public uh, policy principles and with the best uh, interest for the for the compliance with the regulations and so on. But I think sometimes the the the, the rules become too slow to to manage in in a proper partnership uh, approach with other institutions. I think that uh, something else that I would like to to highlight is the we are working as as a as an agency with the countries which are not members of the European Union and uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is to support them to adapt and uh, take that maximum advantages of uh, in this uh, fair digital and green transition. I think that we should be able to apply also these uh, advantages of uh, advanced digitalization and uh, greening of the of the economy and also um, uh, a more inclusive and, and um, respect for diversity in, in the way we are procuring. And I think these are opportunities that uh, we need to, to see how to adapt to our procurement rules. Thank you very much um, for this, uh, Mr. De Cortada. Um, uh, Joanna, one question. The Court of Auditors has been auditing uh, agencies for quite a while and so has a lot of experience in there. Um, what, uh, what are the key challenges for agencies and uh, should the rules change? Okay, thank you. <laughs> These are, are a lot of questions, uh, interesting questions, and I will try, of course, uh, to answer uh, to all of them. Uh, uh, but before I do so, I would like to give uh, uh, the context. Uh, what is the size we're talking about for the EU agencies? Uh, uh, as you know, procurement is an important part of the EU agency's budget. We talk um, for an estimate of uh, 2 to 2.5 billion euros uh, um, of expenditure implemented uh, on an annual, annual basis uh, through public procurement. In our audits, uh, we frequently come across irregularities and shortcomings in this area. And in our 2021 report that was just out today, and as Mr. Sadius already this morning uh, uh, mentioned, uh, almost half of our observations uh, relate to procurement, and all the quantified errors uh, that we have found also relate to procurement. Uh, and uh, by the way, this is similar to what we have found in previous years. So half of the agencies uh, we have audited uh, in 2021 uh, had procurement irregularities of various uh, kinds, uh, some of which uh, were recurring. For example, in the last three years, uh, there are agencies, uh, around 18 agencies, uh, that had uh, more than two uh, procurement uh, observations. Uh, so. And these irregularities, uh, they're not limited to the tendering procedure itself, uh, but often relate uh, to the implementation of the contracts such as uh, uh, the extensions, extensions uh, increases in the values or modifications of the scope of the contracts, which uh, went uh, beyond the flexibility that is allowed by the financial uh, regulation. Uh, what we see is that the challenges that these e um, EU bodies uh, face in complying with the EU public procurement uh, rules usually arise from, from time pressure to commit and spend the funds uh, uh, from insufficient administrative resources, uh, lack of expertise, or weaknesses in their internal controls. Uh, and these conditions uh, result uh, in shortcuts uh, being taken, uh, such as making uh, a justified use of uh, the negotiated procedure, signing contracts uh, uh, not covered by an offer, extending the duration, or um, uh, or adding uh, contractual conditions uh, that go beyond the flexibility that is allowed by the financial regulation. You would agree with me that all these uh, cases breach procurement and uh, affect the fair competition. So coming now to your last question on simplification, and I think that this was already touched uh, by many of the colleagues on this panel, 
uh, it is clear that there is some room for simplifying the financial regulations and there have been uh, efforts made in the, in the past to do so. So while all efforts uh, uh, to simplify the procurement rules should obviously be welcome because uh, of increased uh, um, efficiencies uh, that, and gains that this can result and less errors, the difficulty is in ensuring that the objectives of um, a fair uh, competition, of equal treatment and transparency, that these are not compromised. The rules need to be sufficiently clear and robust because we all know that if with unclear rules, usually implementation is difficult to follow and we may end up with unfair competition, poor value for money and of course an increased number of legal challenges. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ioana. Um, well, talking about simplification of rules, um, the Commission has just presented its proposal for a new financial regulation and uh, that was before the summer. Um, so what are the key changes uh, and developments for public procurement and, and how and what challenges did this pose for the agencies of, of deferring size and mandates? Uh, back to uh, uh, Ms. Aldea Busquets. Uh, thank you for, uh, for this question. It's true the Commission has presented a recast financial regulation and it was presented in May. Uh, sometimes, well, always when we do a, a modification of the financial regulation, we want to simplify things. Sometimes we simplify one thing and we complicate another thing. Eh? That is, uh, I realize that not always everything is simpler at the end. And you need to understand that now the financial regulation is being discussed with the Parliament and the Council and the final product of the financial regulation will be after the political negotiation. And sometimes during the political negotiation, the, the provisions are complicated. But in this, uh, this modification of the financial regulation, it's not an open modification. It's a modification that uh, has three main uh, aspects. The first one is to adapt the procurement rules for crisis situation because we have uh, we have learned a lot of the COVID situation. The second is the alignment with the EU directives and simplifications. And the third strand is the correction of some clerical errors. I will concentrate with the two first. The first one is what we have introduced as a modification taking into account this crisis that we have had uh, from uh, 2020. And this modification that we have introduced also applies to the agencies. The first one is that we have com uh, complement the definition of crisis because we want also to cover the public uh, health emergency situations. That is one aspect that is important. Uh, the second modification is the possibility to modify contracts without a new procurement procedure taking into account some, uh, some definitions that are uh, uh, for that. The third one is the flexibility to add new contracting authorities after launching a, a joint procurement, even after the signature with an amendment. That is also a new, uh, a new element of flexibility. Another element of flexibility is the negotiated procedure without a publication of a contract, a contract notice. And there are two elements that are important for the agencies, is the possibility for agencies to act as a central purchasing body in order to donate or resell to member states, and the possibility for agencies to carry out procurement on behalf or in the name of member states. That are the main uh, modifications that we have introduced, taking into account the crisis situation. Uh, concerning the second strand, that means the alignment with the, the directives, there are also some modifications that are very interesting for the agencies. One is uh, concerning the conflict of interest. It's a, a subject now that is uh, in everywhere that we are discussing a lot is the professional conflicting interest that are we have reinforced the existing provisions. That is an aspect that is important and is important to understand what how to apply the new provisions. The second one is the digitalization of procurement procedures with the alignment of the directive. And that is linked what I have said before, that it's important to have all the process in um, very uh, in, in digi digitalized 
And I think the, the solution that the Commission is proposing to the agencies in, is in this uh, direction. Um, requesting, um, giving answer to a, a question of the agencies, we have also introduced a recital for use of green procurement. That is also an important aspect. Another one is uh, we have simpl uh, simplification and correction of errors and we have aligned uh, the alignment of the thresholds. And I think all of that will introduce some flexibility uh, for the management of the procurement inside the agencies. What are the challenges for the agencies? I think the challenges concerning this uh, proposal is to understand well what are the proposals that we have done that applies to the agencies. Um, I think it's good that I said uh, that the two possibilities for central purchasing body and to, to procure on behalf of member states, because if that is adopted, uh, you can already plan how to do that, because the, the, the discussion of the, the financial regulation will take minimum one year, maybe more. That means that you have a little bit time to start preparing this phase, not to start preparing when the financial regulation will be uh, adopted. And I think it's to, to train the people inside the agencies for not only the, the previous uh, uh, rules for procurement, but also for the new ones, and to follow all the guidance that uh, the Commission will uh, will prepare, taking into account what are the final uh, provisions that will be adopted by the Budget Authority. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Aldea Busquets. Um, I'd like to get back to uh, Mr. De Cortada at ETF uh, regarding these proposals uh, of the new financial regulation. You, of course, I am sure have read them and not only, not only heard the, uh, the summary given by, uh, by the Commission now. Um, do you think they go into the right direction? And, and if so, uh, it, should there be any additional changes uh, that you consider necessary to best achieve your mission? Yes, yeah, I think they, they are going in the in the right direction. I think that definitely all these things that uh, Maria Rosa was saying now, it's it's very specifically very very needed. No, perhaps uh, they need to be more concretized and more developed. Eh? For example, I think the principle of only once uh, uh, when uh, requesting information from. Um, from the supplier is, is a very good principle and uh, on, on this European single proc uh, procurement document, but still this needs to be operationalized and uh, um, particularly between the, this document and the ECERTIS and the national databases, this is still not uh, operational and I think um, it will imply some complexity for, to put them together. But of course, for, for an agency like that, uh, to be checking all the time uh, many documents that uh, are already existing in, in public uh, bodies, I think that is uh, also a matter of, uh, of uh, technologies and artificial intelligence and uh, ways of uh, making these more possible to, to be checked. And in general, all the use of tools that um, I allow to to have this uh, submission of uh, an opening of, of tenders in a more automat automatized way or the the notifications of the ER words or um, through the portal publication of uh, information, all the things, even e-invoicing, all these things, I think uh, there, are, there is the potential there, but still needs to be more developed. Huh? I think uh, also there's already been some mention now of the about the possibility of joining interinstitutional contracts where they are already in stage. I think this is particularly useful because very often you find that other EU uh, body or institution who already has a contract and uh, you have to contract at the end for something that is already being procured. I think uh, obviously we, we rely one on another and we think that the the other organization has been running those uh, contracts in an efficient way. No? There is issues like, I don't know, the routine of administrative expenses that uh, could be also be treated in, in, a, in a more efficient and simplified way. Uh, the time limit for management boards to for consultation of, of transfers, which sometimes makes uh, this uh, very slow process. And, and so on. I think the, there is, um, as you know, the, there is this uh, in the financial regulation, this uh, uh, idea of uh, ex ante and ex post evaluation uh, for 
reports which imply a certain significant spending. <clears throat> there is not a, a specific reference to, to agencies. I think this is something that the, the network of agencies could develop and uh, this will also uh, probably better adapted to the size and the reality of, uh, of the agencies. Um, I already mentioned this issue of, of grants and, and partnerships. Uh, we are working every time more and more with the international organizations in, in fields where we are uh, talking about uh, co-creation of knowledge or we are talking about uh, working together to advise the, our partner countries. And, and there, I think um, the, the, the rules of uh, has no, no sense to go for um, uh, a public procurement to, um, um, let's say, use the resources of a, of a partner. No, so this is something that is not matching well. Uh, we've been using, for example, in some of our studies, uh, the algorithms for um, big data of certain uh, things. Um, for this, we don't have uh, the copyright, but uh, uh, formally we are buying this from, from the pro uh, provider, despite we are not buying their, their rights. So these are things that uh, still are not running efficiently for us. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, <clears throat> this issue of sustainable and socially responsible um, procurement, uh, I think something that we need to define a little bit better, perhaps, which are the, the matters of, um, of compliance with uh, environmental um, um, obligations that uh, might exclude, for example, some tenders in, in some in some in, in some procurements and uh, more clear provisions on which are these matters which are the if we can make reference to the production methods instead of only to products or or to working conditions or things like that i think uh, um, the, even the i don't know the integration of disabled or disadvantaged workers uh, use of smes i mean these are all these ideas that could make our our procurement uh, more socially responsible and I think uh, we are still waiting for for this and um, and in in designing uh, this uh, European single procurement document uh, we could see how to establish uh, the the accreditation of uh, of the suppliers in some of these topics thank you mr de cortada um Back to EU, Lisa, uh, Mr. Garkov, um, if you could have a wish list, uh, what would you put on that for the new financial regulation? Okay, that's a really tricky, tricky question. Well, let me start, uh, uh, and I would like to, to repeat what I said in my previous intervention. The evolution of the procurement rules should shift the focus from formal compliance to efficiency. And I'm very glad uh, what I heard from Maria Rosa because I think uh, the changes now, now uh, under development in the financial uh, regulation go uh, into precisely that direction. But of course, uh, from the point of view of you, Lisa, uh, there are things that really needs to be considered and embedded into the evolution of the financial and procurement rules in order really to uh, stimulate efficiency. Well, first of all, uh, we need more flexibility, and I, I, I want to emphasize that for a very simple reason. Uh, most of the EU agencies uh, operate in very dynamic uh, uh, political and regulatory environment. Quite, quite often we need to deal with the legislation which is incomplete, but still we need to deliver our tasks. So if we are forced to do from formal compliance point of view everything by the book, that will have effects on EU policies and that will, that will have effects on EU as a whole. So flexibility and putting the uh, procurement rules into the particular operation and political context is important. Uh, furthermore, we need, I would like to see uh, some evolution of the way the um, uh, uh, length of the procurement procedures are defined in the uh, procurement rules, because at the moment uh, that's uh, something that uh, puts lots of inefficiency i would say especially when we speak about procurement of technology and technology uh, solutions uh, more freedom in the choice of uh, sourcing uh, approaches and uh, products as well um, 
I think it is also important when we speak about simplifi simplification of procurement rules to make them more precise in order to limit the possibilities of interpretation because that doesn't help much uh, when it comes down to decisions what procurement approach to take uh, in each particular situation neither when when it when the interactions between the European Court of Auditors and the agencies um, uh, start and in are in progress uh, last but not least uh, by importance uh, it was said many times how important it is to uh, to respect competition but the procurement rules should be aligned with reality on the market and when we speak about technologies when we speak about uh, technology solutions that reality quite often in a natural way uh, limits the competition and if then agencies are forced uh, formally to follow the uh, the rules for simulating competition that in fact may introduce inefficiency and losses for the EU budget and the opposite so this is really important uh, evolution that will be beneficial so as i hope uh, to conclude when we speak about the evolution of the procurement rules they need to go at least when we speak about areas of operations uh, like a few lisa or similar agencies to models closer to public private partnerships rather than to the classic way uh, that procurement uh, is done in the past in the public uh, uh, public organizations Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garkov. Uh, back to you, Anna Metaxopoulou. Um, of course, auditors, when they audit the audits, find shortcomings and are generally critical. But not only critical, you also have good practices, I suppose, that you extract from your audits of EU agencies. Are there some related to procurement that actually could be mentioned? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, in our audits on public procurement, uh, we usually come across uh, um, and we have identified a number of uh, good practices uh, and in our audit report on the EU agencies we have made recommendations uh, to the EU agencies in this area. Uh, Maria Rosa has already mentioned, presented earlier, a number of important tools that are available to the EU agencies and my advice will be that the EU agencies make uh, the best use of these tools that are already available. As time, uh, our time is limited, uh, I will just refer to a few um, examples that uh, I consider important. Uh, they have already been touched uh, by other participants uh, in this uh, panel. And I will start uh, with uh, joint procurements. Uh, joint procurements, uh, in my opinion, they present a good opportunity for cooperation among the EU bodies and they offer an opportunity to exchange know-how and obtain better quality. By pooling our resources uh, together, we can achieve increased competition, better contractual conditions, and potentially better value for money. So there are uh, many such examples uh, today. I mean, uh, there are uh, joint procurements, for example, on IT services uh, that are led by the Commission with the participation of other institutions, including, of course, the European Court of Auditors and the EU agencies. Uh, and uh, as we've heard uh, earlier, uh, the recast uh, on the financial regulation will provide uh, further flexibility uh, in this uh, direction. So also, I would like to refer to the EU agencies network, which is a very positive development in, in this direction, uh, as it has facilitated uh, the inter-agency cooperation uh, in different areas, including in the area of uh, public procurement. And um, uh, this uh, has brought, uh, in my opinion, increased administrative efficiencies and economies of scale. For example, I mean, uh, we heard uh, uh, agencies uh, such as the ETF that are so small in size, uh, um, uh, they have a stronger bargaining uh, power when they participate uh, uh, in competitions through such networks. Uh, just to mention uh, some uh, data, um, by the end of 2021, there were 18 joint procurements organized by the EU agencies network, uh, with eight agencies participating on average per joint procurement. Uh, I think that this is a game changer that has already produced uh, positive results uh, um, in the last five years. So moving now to digitalization. Uh, in my opinion, new digital technologies also offer um, great opportunities to streamline and simplify the procurement processes. Uh, 
And uh, for example, uh, as Maria Rosa already referred uh, to the e-procurement uh, IT corporate solution that the Commission is developing, uh, uh, this can bring uh, greater transparency and efficiency in the whole process. Uh, uh, currently, a lot of agencies participate in the different modules. Uh, uh, in 2021, I will just mention some statistics uh, for uh, uh, the discussion. I mean, e-submission e -submission was uh, um, uh, used by 93% of the agencies, uh, while e-preparation and e-request were used uh, by up to 30% of the agencies. However, e-evaluation, that is also an important uh, um, component uh, of the public procurement process uh, has only been used uh, by 9% of the agencies. So to conclude, uh, I would like to add that it is important that we all work together, that we openly share uh, the good and bad experiences uh, that we have in implementing uh, procurement uh, procedures and in identifying opportunities, of course, to streamline and reduce the burden on both sides, both on the tenderer side, but also on the contracting authority side. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Joanna. Um, we're getting close to the end of, of this panel discussion. I would like to get back to uh, uh, Aldea, Ms. Aldea Busquets with um, the following question. You've heard now um, the challenges uh, and wishes uh, of the of two agencies, EU, ELISA and ETF. So what are your takeaways in view of the discussion, of course, the new financial regulation and procurement rules uh, and also, of course, the political debate that needs to uh, carry on now between also the the Parliament and the Council. Uh, yes, I would like to thank uh, Javier and Coulomb for the the suggestions and proposals. It's always very interesting, and I think as Joanna said, the important is to work together to discuss, and all these aspects needs to be discussed in this network that exists, that uh, the budget is there, and I uh, I encourage the agencies, you are here, but the others, that the points, the problems that they would like to discuss, they are uh, raised in this uh, in this network. And also we are discussing all, a, a, a lot with the court, because the court is doing a lot of audits on, on procurements, and we have always uh, sometimes we we have different views but we we discuss in a constructive manner and we try to find what are the the best recommendations for everybody and i think this uh this type what how we are working i think it's the best way to improve on the future you are saying that you would like more flexibility i understand me too because when uh, we need to launch a public procurement uh, every five years, I have forgotten all the rules and I would like to do things differently, but it's not the case. As I said at the beginning, we need to, to, to apply the rules of the directive, of the public uh, directive. It's true that some flexibility could be introduced and I would like to say that during the COVID, we have succeeded a lot. We have been very imaginative uh, because nothing was closed nothing was stopped we continue to work thanks that it was an interpretation to the ideas that has been introduced um to be applied during this uh, during this part of the the COVID that everybody was watching uh, from home and the idea of uh, i think it was javier saying it's always the procurement the best solution i think needs to be analyzed i i think not sometimes there are simplified uh, forms of grants that could be applied by the agencies. I think it's something that we need to discuss with you. I think it's a, it's a good uh, proposal. It's also in my list the things that it will be uh, ideas to, flexible, uh, to, to introduce flexibility in the, in the agencies. On the, on the part of the joint procurement, I agree. I think there are good examples of joint procurement between the agencies and the commission for IT and for other domains. We need to maybe to potentiate a little bit more, but I think it's the, the, the way forward. The specificities that Eurodisa has, I think the commission has the same. The commission is implementing a lot of uh, in digital programs. We are procuring, we are uh, buying uh, new tools. I think uh, a, a good coordination how the commission is working and, and you and to find um, 
good ideas. I think it would be also uh, a way because everything related to IT is very particular. I know that it's very particular, it's very different, and the, the reality, as you said, is moving. It's moving faster than the rules. And, uh, and we need uh, to, to work together what is the best way. But at the same time, uh, Groom, you have requested more precise rules. And that I don't, I disagree because more precise rules that we are putting, uh, you need to satisfy all the rules. And if not, the court will say that is an error. Uh, no, because it's, uh, what is the message that the court is passing always? That the rules are too complicated more uh, provisions we are putting, everything needs to be uh, applied. I think we need to find the good balance. Something needs to be maybe in Abade Mekun explain a little bit or give options, but not everything can be uh, fixed because then you don't have any, any flexibility. That is, uh, or maybe I have not understood well uh, uh, your point. Um, on the IT, I think uh, we need to uh, to advance in this procurement solution that uh, the Commission is uh, it's uh, working. Artificial intelligence, we are working on that. I, I totally agree with the proposal of Javier. We need to to apply much more artificial intelligence and to to avoid that the same control is done three times. That it's not uh, it's not possible, and I think to use already the portal Sedia can simplify a little bit some of the the controls that we are doing. On conclusions, I think the best is to to discuss together, to work together, uh, trying to find the best solution, and also to to invite the court because I think it's important that the solution that we are finding together, uh, the court can also agree because the words will be that we find a solution and then the court disagrees and we will have uh, additional problems. I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, direct reactions, uh, perhaps first, uh, Mr. Garkov. Yes, thank you. I will be uh, very brief and uh, I, I, I cannot agree more with what uh, Maria Rosa said about particularities in the procure when we speak about procurement uh, in the area of technologies. I will be glad you Lisa to work even more closely than it does already with Commission to address those. To be to be clear, I'm not asking for more rules. I'm asking for rules that are less subject of interpretation because this is our greatest one of the greatest challenge when we face uh, teams of the Court of Auditors and we need to work together through the uh, audit of the annual accounts, because often it happens that interpretation of the rules of the agency differs from the interpretation of the rules by the court, and both interpretations are, are correct. They do not say that something is wrong or, or irregular. So, for that reason, the more clear and less prone to interpretation the rules are, the better without being more or more complex. Thank you. Xavier um, Mateo de Cortada, you want to react as well? Yeah, it's very, very, very simple. I think uh, there was a reference this morning uh, of uh, Rimanta saying that half of the observations are on procurement, uh, but also that the, the way of simplifying rules uh, is uh, also to 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 reduce the the, the errors. Eh? So I think uh, it, it is a complex relationship between the, this uh, pre precision and at the same time. Uh, uh, simplification. I think uh, it's, it's good that this dialogue is here. Second thing I wanted to say is that um, also this morning there was um, it was said that uh, <clears throat> talking about the revolving doors, eh? but I think it's also applicable here is that to to tackle the, some of these issues that we are talking, it's a mix of uh, processes, structures, and and also a change of culture uh, and the leadership they were mentioning. I think not always everything is is a question of of rules. Very often, it's also a question of um, of um, uh, of applying um, common intelligence and and uh, and more guidance from from the services that uh, Maria Rosa was uh, 
uh, explaining very well at the beginning the, how this works. And the third thing is that something that uh, has been uh, said by Joana and, uh, and also Maria Rosa is that um, uh, the agencies are also accumulating a lot of experience and I think uh, the last meeting we had of the network here in Barcelona, we were talking about uh, a partnership and uh, relationship with the Commission services because uh, it's not always that the, the Commission set the rules and we applied. I think it, it's a it's a more rich uh, relationship and very often with uh, some of our uh, small experiences due to our size, we can perhaps bring also ideas. So I think this, I encourage also this uh, continuing this dialogue in the, in the framework of the network. Thank you very much uh, to, all, to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one final comment from the Commission, maybe, Ms. Andrea Busquets? No, I, no. Um, I would like to thank uh, all of you. It has been a pleasure to be here with plenty of ideas and uh, the takeaway is that we need to continue to discuss together in the network and I'm pretty sure that you will have uh, other ideas and, and, and also for us and for this interpretation of the rules, we need to see how we can, what we can do. That it's uh, something because the interpretation of the rules is not only for you, as I said, finally in the Commission we have I'm 40 uh, DGs, that means it's 40 mini agencies because each DG is procuring. Uh, and I think we need to, to work all together. Thank you very much uh, for this constructive uh, uh, panel. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you all, uh, all panelists, for, for this discussion indeed. So, as a short conclusion, more needs to be discussed. Simplification has come back a lot. Uh, also, e procurement, uh, sustainability issues, uh, how to address the multiple dimensions of the agencies and how the rules can apply best to them. And of course, last but not least, a new financial regulation that probably will, will tackle all this and so the debate goes on. Uh, thank you again to uh, uh, the four panelists uh, for, for joining us. Um, and this brings us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the uh, end of this conference. Um, uh, I would like to thank all the participants, all the presentations, all the panelists, and of course everybody uh, that has been following us on YouTube Live. You may have seen that we are broadcasting from a bit of a new uh, format here. It was uh, the first conference uh, organized this way. Uh, so I would also make a, a quick thank you, give a quick thank you to the technical team that has made this possible. And uh, well, I would say until next time, and in the meantime, you can read all about the performance of EU agencies in today's uh, annual report for the financial year 2021, published by the European Court of Auditors on its website. Thank you very much to all, and I would say over and out from Luxembourg here. Goodbye. <laughs>